Uh, good morning and welcome back to the committee's 19th meeting in 2019. Could I ask those people who have joined the committee at this stage to make sure your mobile phones are on silent? We are now moving on to agenda item two, which is the Transport Scotland Bill, and we are going to begin our consideration of stage two amendments to that bill. I would like to welcome the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity and his supporting officials. And I will briefly like to explain the procedure of how this meeting will continue for those that are watching. There will be one debate on each group of amendments. I will call the member who lodged the first amendment in that group to speak to and move that amendment and speak to all the other amendments in the group. I then will call on other members who have lodged amendments in that group. Members who have not lodged amendments in that group but wish to speak should catch my attention. If he has not already spoken to the group, I will then invite the Cabinet Secretary to contribute to the debate. The debate on the group will be concluded by me inviting the member who moved the first amendment in that group to wind up. Following the debate on each group, I will check to whether the member who has moved the first amendment in the group wishes to press it to a vote or withdraw it. If they wish to press ahead, I will put the question on that amendment. If a member wishes to withdraw their amendment after it has been moved, they must seek the agreement of other members to do so. If any member present objects, the committee uh, immediately moves to vote on that amendment. If any member does not want to move the amendment when called, they should say, not moved. Please note that any other member present may move such an amendment. If no one moves the amendment, I will then immediately call the next amendment on the marshalled list. Only committee members will be allowed to vote, and voting in, divi in the division will be by a show of hands. If I could remind members that it's important that they keep their hands clearly raised until the clerk has recorded the vote. The committee is required to indicate formally that it has considered and agreed each section of the bill, so I will put a question on each section at the appropriate point. Today, we are hoping to get through part one and two of the bill. And so at that stage, we shall move uh, uh, straight on uh, to the amendments. And the first amendment I'm going to call is Amendment 40 in the name of Colin Smith in a group on its own. Colin Smith to move and speak to the Amendment 40, please. Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, amendment 40 in my name sets out key principles that, that I believe should be at the heart of our transport system. And the Transport Bill provides an opportunity to place these in legislation. Setting them in legislation provides a, a long term vision for our transport system. At a time the Government are about to embark on a review of our national transport strategy. This amendment would place a duty on relevant bodies to act in line with these principles when carrying out such a review uh, and ensure that transport policy is guided in a meaningful way. The principles themselves, I believe, reflect the priorities most of us hold for transport while being broad enough not to be restrictive. Putting these principles on a statutory footing will help guide policy making to deliver the outcomes that we want to see. There will, of course, be an opportunity to add or amend to the exact wording at stage three if members um, have specific concerns over the wording of the, the, the particular amendment. And there is precedent for setting out principles such as this in law. Section 1 of the Government's Social Security Act sets out very clearly the Scottish Government's Scottish Social Security principles. So I'm happy to move my uh, amendment 40 in my name, and I'm sure I'll get unanimous support to get us off to a winning start. Um, uh, Stuart, you would like to pass comment. Uh, thank you very much. I've, I've got a number of comments about uh, the way in which uh, this amendment is constructed. Um, it, first one is that uh, 2A, transport is a key enabler for the realisation of all other of, of other human rights. It is worth reminding ourselves, of course, that uh, everything we do in this Parliament is already covered by a requirement uh, to conform to the Convention, uh, European Convention on Human Rights. So it would appear, unless I hear otherwise, to be superfluous to, to make that particular statement. And in any event, all our legislation could equally be described for the reason I've just stated. Now, um, further down, we have a number of uh, mentions of, starting at 2B, the delivery of transport as a public service and supports the common good. Now, the word transport presents a substantial difficulty uh, 
when it stands naked and without qualification, because my private car is transport, uh, a commercial aircraft is transport, and uh, when, we're, when we're getting down to D3, ensure affordability does not, it's a barrier to people accessing transport services, um, that, that draws within it, because of the uh, use of the, the term that's uh, used, um, my getting on a first-class flight uh, from uh, Scotland all the way to Australia. Uh, th th there would be a requirement that the transport system makes that affordable for me. So I think without addressing the underlying uh, policy issue uh, that there is associated with this amendment, I think the construction of the amendment um, does not meet uh, the needs of any policy uh, that I could sensibly support. Thank you, Stuart. Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Uh, first of all, I'm going to thank Colin Smith for his uh, amendment. It's a good start to the uh, session. Um, and comment really that I think there's some admirable intentions uh, in the wording here. I think uh, delivering public transport, which is accessible, universal, affordable, uh, geographically consistent and sustainable are all themes that this committee has debated in great detail uh, since it started. Um, but they are admirable policies, but they are policies. Uh, and I would uh, suggest that Mr Smith instead could put them in his party's next manifesto rather than on the face of the transport bill. I think they are admirable policies, um, uh, which I commend him for. But I think it's an uh, overly prescriptive list of policies uh, which he wants the government to take on board, but really doesn't describe any context as to how they would be achieved or indeed how much any of it would cost. Uh, so for that reason, uh, we would be unable to support Amendment 40. Thank you. Um, John. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I, 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 like others, I think these are admirable uh, principles and, and I'm very um, much supportive of them. Um, I listened to what Mr Stevenson says, and I don't think that would preclude support and, and clarification of indeed if that was thought necessary, so I, I will certainly be lending support to Colin. Thank you. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener. I'd like to welcome the fact that Mr Smith's amendments uh, look at transport in its wider strategic context. It's welcome because it's uh, very easy to get bogged down in the detail of legislation and to lose sight of the bigger picture. Much of the language of the amendment reflects the work that this government has been doing as part of a review of the National Transport Strategy, on which we are due to consult this summer. The strategy puts inequality and the promotion of fairness, accessibility, sustainability, health and well-being at the heart of transport, and these are all themes reflected in the provisions proposed here by Mr Smith. Our draft, version, our draft vision for the strategy is that we will have a sustainable, inclusive and accessible transport system, helping to deliver a healthier, more prosperous and fairer Scotland for communities, businesses and visitors. The vision is underpinned by four themes. These include a priority to promote equality, which is designed to achieve outcomes of affordability and accessibility of transport. This sits alongside three further priorities uh, relating to tackling climate change, helping our economy prosper and improving our health and well-being. Many of the principles in Colin Smith's amendment are therefore already at the heart of the work this government is taking forward through its National Transport Strategy Review and we will seek to embed in a national strategic context when the review is concluded. And there is an argument that policy principles of this kind are better expressed in such strategic guidance. Their relative lack of technical precision it may sit uneasily in legislation and the relative certainty and rigidity uh, with which they would require to be interpreted in that context may be counterproductive. Of course, guidance documents backed by statute, if necessary, offer a more flexible and responsive means by which to set out key strategic objectives for the delivery of public functions. I'm therefore not persuaded that statutory duties are the most effective means of achieving the aims Mr Smith has in mind here. Those concerns aside, uh, certain aspects of how the amendment is drafted is potentially problematic. 
The main duty in subsection 1 is that Scottish ministers, local authorities, local transport authorities and RTPs uh, must, when exercising their functions in relation to transport, do so with the objective of adhering to the principles set out in subsection 2. It's not clear what legal consequences is intended to follow if a person subject to the duty does not adhere to the principles or could be shown not uh, to have, a, to have uh, the objectives adhered to in taking forward their policy. And the functions uh, to which the duty is to apply are also uncertain. The phrase functions in relation to transport may capture functions of a broadly strategic nature to which these principles or principles uh, like them may be relevant, but may also encompass operational transport functions such as traffic regulation functions, where obligations to adhere to principles of this kind may be inappropriate when set against the public safety imperative that underpin the exercise of those functions. While the general thrust of the principles themselves uh, is commendable, uh, the specific framing of some of those uh, is also uh, a matter which could cause some ambiguity and would also have consequences to their legal effect. For all of those reasons, while I am sympathetic to Mr Smith's aims, I cannot support this amendment. But I would like to consider whether we can embed these principles in our national transport strategy or alternatively agree to return at stage three with a revised amendment. I would hope that Colin Smith would agree to work with me and my officials in taking forward that consideration. Additionally, I am aware that Mr Smith has lodged amendments on accessibility and on meeting the needs of those living in poverty and on low incomes in relation to bus services. These amendments will, of course, be debated later, but I would, uh, in particular, like to explore with Mr Smith between now and Stage 3 whether issues of this kind may be more appropriate uh, as a matter which could be set out in the transport principles, uh, whatever uh, form that may take. And as such, I would ask Colin Smith not to press Amendment 40, uh, but if pressed, I would urge the committee to vote against it. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for that uh, comprehensive uh, explanation. Um, Colin, would, would you like to wind up and press or withdraw your amendment, please? Thank, thank you, Convener. I mean, I think as a nation we have lost sight of, of the bigger picture, which was mentioned earlier, of what our transport system should be about, particularly the fact that it is and should be a public service that is accessible to all. Uh, the, the, the specific points raised by Stuart Stevenson, the Cabinet Secretary, sounded very much like concerns over specific wording itself, uh, and these can clearly be dealt with, um, I, I think, at stage three. I uh, will give a commitment to Jamie Green that these will be in the next Labour manifesto, and I look forward to his uh, full support. <laughs> However, in light of, of the Cabinet Secretary's offer to, to work on the detail of these principles, potentially a, a, an amendment at stage three, um, or setting up these principles in another way, then I would be happy not to, to press the amendment at this, this stage and take up that offer to discuss the matter uh, further. Okay. Okay, thank you, Colin. Uh, I have to uh, ask, therefore, if any member objects to the amendment being uh, with, withdrawn. No. No. Okay, thank you. So we will now call Amendment 32 in the name of Janie, Jamie Green, grouped with Amendments 220 and 201. Jamie Green, can you move Amendment 32 and speak to all amendments in the group, please? Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, from the outset, I will move my Amendments 32 and 201, if required. Um, so this, uh, it, basically from the outset, when we are talking about low emission zones, as I wanted to add a, a primary objective uh, that sets out a clear purpose for uh, how each low, uh, low emission zone should follow. In effect, uh, this stipulates that the purpose of a low emission zone is to reduce transport-related emissions and particulate matter in and within the vicinity of the zone in which it operates. Uh, the wording itself is taken uh, and has been lifted from the National Emission Ceilings Regulation 2018 Bill, which is a UK uh, piece of legislation uh, transposing an EU directive of a similar uh, name and nature, uh, which provides an up-to-date definition of emission standards, which is consistent across the UK and indeed across Europe. I appreciate it seems rather detailed and specific, but I did feel it necessary for part one of the bill uh, to contain an overarching and specific purpose. Uh, and my rationale for this uh, is 
threefold. The first is it removes any ambiguity over what the zones are for and what they're trying to achieve. The whole point of low emission zones, in my view, is to improve air quality within the, emission, within the proximity of a zone. Now, it's fair to say that uh, reducing congestion, improving average road speeds, uh, generating uh, revenue for local authorities are all indeed byproducts of the zones. But I want public support for these and to take drivers and road users with us on this journey. We need to be clear to them that this isn't just a tax on motorists. The zones will have a positive and measurable impact on their cities. And that's the second reason. But having a defined purpose allows us to monitor the success or otherwise of a zone. If nitrogen and oxide emissions and particulate matter levels do not fall as a result of a zone, then clearly something is amiss. If we have a vague definition of the zone, then it's virtually impossible to ascertain whether it has been successful in its aims. As we saw uh, as a committee when we questioned Nottingham Council over the workplace parking levy, they found it difficult to pinpoint the specific environmental benefits of that measure as it was part of a package of measures and instead was often seen largely as a revenue generating activity which low emission zones are not nor should be. And the third reason is that I have later amendments which link that the revenue generated from uh, the fines achieved through the zones uh, must go towards meeting uh, the overarching objective of the zone. I, I hope members that will agree that there should be a purpose of a low emission zone on the face of the bill. My wording tries to identify something which is measurable as opposed to a vague concept which makes it impossible to measure against and equally could be used subjectively to decide uh, if a zone is working or not. Uh, Colin Smith's amendment, I appreciate, tries to do something similar, um, but in my view uh, the wording is such uh, that it is helpful but unmeasurable uh, and for that reason I think my wording is better. Um, amendment 201 uh, inserts, uh, indeed as, as, I, as I am proposing a primary objective for the zone, um, this relates to uh, the setting up, uh, section 9 of the bill setting up a zone and indeed requires that local authorities uh, set objectives which complement and contribute towards the primary objective of the zone uh, and amendment 201 stipulates that any such secondary objective set by local authorities must be aligned with the primary purpose on the face of the bill. Thank you. Uh, Colin Smith, can I ask you to speak to amendment 20 and other <coughs> amendments in the group please? Th thank you, Convener. Amendment 220 uh, in my name introduces a definition of the purpose of an LEZ. This was one of the, the committee's stage one recommendation. It helps to clarify the purposes of LEZs and, and in practical terms will ensure that all schemes are developed in line with this overall aim. I appreciate the bill already requires LEZs to contribute towards local authorities' objectives under the Environment Act 1995, but I believe we should be clear about the specific role to be played by LEZs beyond local authorities' existing responsibilities. As we've already heard, Jamie Green has tabled a similar amendment, Amendment 32, but I, I do have some concerns around the specific wording. The wording of, of Jamie's amendment excludes PM10 particulate matter. No, PM10 partic particles are amongst the most dangerous elements of air pollution, and reducing them is crucial to a successful LEZ. If this amendment is agreed, uh, Amendment 32, it, it is critical that reference to PM10 is added at Stage 3. However, I also have a, a broader concern about how specific Amendment 32 is, as new technologies are developed in the future, there is a chance this will result in new pollutants being released into the atmosphere. By detailing on the face of the bill what constitutes air pollution, there is a risk that it won't be fit for purpose in the long term. I believe the language used in my amendment provides a, a more comprehensive and more future-proof definition. To, to, to coin Jamie Green's phrase, I think it's better. Additionally, my amendment calls for ongoing improvements to air quality. Well, I think this is important. There's no safe level of air pollution and LEZs should be seeking to continually improve air quality as long as they are in place on an ongoing basis, not simply reduce it on a one-off basis. Thank you, uh, Colin. Uh, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, talking on uh, Jamie Green's number 32, um, like uh, Colin Smith, I, I, I think the emission of the 10 micrometers uh, particles is quite serious. I've tried to have a very quick look at the legislation. 
uh, that Jamie Green referred to, but I, in the one minute available, I haven't been able to read it comprehensively. But I will say that the definition of fine particular particular matter, which is provided in Jamie uh, Green's uh, amendment, being particles with an aerodynamic diameter equal to or less than 2.5 micrometers, presents a very substantial difficulty. Uh, the definition of a particle includes the words atom and molecule, and it is of necessity that emissions from a vehicle in a low emission zone will contain atoms and particles, even if they happen to be benign rather than malevolent. And so therefore, uh, as a definition, it fails the, the test, unless, of course, Jamie can point me to um, that there is a, a further qualification in the legislation he pointed to, which is why I was having a quick look at it to see if there was, um, that, that, that provides a definition of particle that uh, makes more sense than the common definition that I find in the, in the, in the diction. So, that's 31. Uh, on Colin Smith's uh, 220, uh, I, I've got difficulties with the construction as well, um, while, while not having any objection to the underlying policy obje uh, objective, in that it says ongoing improvements to the level of air quality. Well, I'm not sure that to the level is required, and I don't know what it means, and I have a suspicion um, that, that level creates a, an ambiguity that's unhelpful to the policy intention. The, the, the other thing that's there, ongoing, putting in the face of the bill, I've got a difficulty with, because of course the ultimate success of a low emission zone scheme is that there will be zero. Uh, emissions that are harmful, uh, and therefore at that point ongoing improvements will cease to be possible. So therefore the construction uh, of the amendment, while the policy intention I think we, we can understand, um, does not adequately support it. Convener. Thank you, Stuart. John Finney. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, Jamie Green's, this is the first of a, a series of amendments, and despite his uh, apparent enthusiasm for low emission zones, there is a dilution the dilution of what the, the, the purpose is there. And I'm not remotely technical, but others have uh, ha have alluded to the science of it, and it's certainly uh, my understanding that it misses some of the pollutants that uh, we're concerned about because it's so narrowly defined. Um, I think inevitably we get into discussions about the competence of, of motions. Well, they are competent or they wouldn't be here if people take exception to what they do or they're not comprehensive enough, so be it. But certainly it's my view that um, Colin Smith's is broad enough for the purpose and I won't be supporting Jamie Green's, I will be supporting Colin. Thank you, uh, John. Um, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, convener, Amendment 32, 220 and 201 call for the purpose of an LEZ to be included in the bill. In my view, these amendments are too restrictive. Amendment 32 would set the purpose of an LEZ around the reduction of two types of transport-related emissions, namely uh, nitrogen oxide and particulate matter with a diameter equal to or less than 2.5 mi micrometres. As our emission types may come into scope in the future, confining the purpose of an LEZ to addressing only these two types of pollutants is far too restrictive. Amendment 201 uh, would limit any objective specified as part of a scheme to ensure that they are related to the purpose of a scheme as set out by Amendment 32, improving air quality of two types of pollutants. As above, uh, this would uh, produce quite restrictive boundaries in the framing of an LEZ and, in my view, would potentially compromise their effectiveness. Amendment 220 would be an alternative to Amendment 32 and to 201 and would restrict the purpose of an LEZ to the improvement of air quality in all or part of a local authority area only. This amendment is broader than the other two put forward, however, still results in restricting how LEZs can be formulated. I agree that low emission zones must be implemented where appropriate to improve air quality. This is why there is a clear mandatory requirement set out in section 94 
that requires local authorities to put LEZs in place that help to meet the air quality objectives prescribed under Section 87.1 of the Environment Act 1995. However, in implying that this is to be the sole purpose of an LEZ, the amendment ignores that the opportunity both now and in the future for other benefits to be realised in some shape or form for a local authority introducing an LEZ, for example, better placemaking that might include congestion management or bus prioritisation. So it is important that local authorities have the flexibility to set their scheme objectives and thus their LEZ purpose as they see fit. I would suggest that we outline the purpose of an LEZ and how to set objectives in the forthcoming LEZ guidance. Section 1.1 and 9.4 can also be used to explain the purpose of an LEZ. What is clear is that LEZs must be put in place first and foremost to help improve air, local air quality. If stakeholders continue to feel that the purpose should be outlined on the face of the bill, this could be considered and developed in conjunction with the government ahead of stage three. As these amendments are currently written, however, the purpose is too restrictive and would hinder future flexibility in the development and purpose of LEZs. For these reasons, convener, I cannot support the amendment 32, 201 or 220 at this stage, but would be open to considering how these amendments could be progressed ahead of stage three. I'd ask Jamie Green and Colin Smith not to press amendments 201 or 222, uh, but if they are pressed, I would urge the committee to reject them. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Jamie Green, can I ask you to wind up and press or withdraw your amendment, please? Thank you, Convener. And, and can I thank members for their, for their comments and, and feedback and, and the spirit in which it was given? Um, naturally, uh, the purpose of my amendment was not to be overly prescriptive, uh, to make it unhelpful, but indeed it is being uh, prescriptive in the sense that there are a number of other uh, ways in which one can measure air quality. But I think the point I'm trying to make, and I hope this is the point that the Cabinet Secretary will pick up on, is that, it, that I do feel that there should be a, a purpose of the zone, and the zone should be directly linked to air quality. And in his answer, it's interesting that the Cabinet Secretary mentioned that local authorities may have other reasons for setting up a zone, such as managing congestion uh, or indeed uh, other uh, objectives. If that's the case, then they should look at measures which are best suited to those objectives, such as congestion charges or parking levies and other forms of, of, of management uh, of traffic flows or volumes in city centres. I always thought from day one that the purpose of a low emission zone is to improve air quality in the cities or the zones in which they operate. And the point of my uh, 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 perhaps misguided wording, uh, uh, albeit uh, uh, amendment, is to ensure that we do put something on the bill which is measurable. Because if it's not measurable, we'll never know if the zones have succeeded or not. It's not about how much money they've raised or how many less fewer cars there are in the cities or how fast those cars are going at average speed. But it's about improving air quality. And if the government's willing to work with members who clearly, uh, by nature of the two amendments that we've put in, uh, have a view that there should be something that allows us to reflect on what the purpose of a zone is. And the purpose of the zone, that, and the message to the public is that the purpose of the zone is to improve the air quality in the cities that they live in. Uh, I, I, I'm sure we'd be happy to work with the government on that. But bearing it away on page five, uh, section nine, that one of the objectives must uh, uh, um, include a reference to another piece of legislation, I don't think is, 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 is strong enough. Uh, and for that reason, um, I would hope the uh, government will, will reflect on that. Thank you, Mr. Green. Can I ask you to press or withdraw your amendment? I withdraw on that basis. Okay. Jamie Green wishes to withdraw Amendment 32. Does any member object? No. Uh, okay. Therefore, the amendment is withdrawn. I therefore call Amendment 220 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 32. Colin Smith to move or not move. Um, in, in light of the commitment by the Cabinet Secretary to work on potential wording for an amendment at stage three, uh, I won't move my amendment. Thank you. Uh, I'd now like to move on to low emission zones and exemptions. I'd like to call Amendment 221 in the name of Rachel Hamilton, Group with amendments 33, 34, 2, 30, 31, 203, 56, 57, 3 and 3A. 
Rachel Hamilton, could you please move Amendment 221, uh, 221 and speak to the amendments in the group, please? Thank you, Convener. I move, move the amendment in my name. I recognise the importance of low emission zones and the purpose it strives to achieve in relation to air quality. However, it is necessary that community transport operators who access city centres in order to bring service users to essential health and social appointments are not penalised and obstructed from carrying out their duties. Currently, only one electric minibus exists on the market, and the previous bus retrofit fund from the Energy Saving Trust did not apply to minibuses. Community bus operators are currently not well placed to embrace technology and will need time to raise funds to invest in cleaner vehicles. As such, I believe the government should commit to an exemption, and I hope that the committee will support my amendment. Thank you. I now call on Jamie Green to speak to Amendment 33 and all other amendments in the group. Jamie. Uh, thank you, Convener. I'm happy to support uh, my colleagues uh, Rachel Hamilton's amendment and uh, indeed the amendments 13 31 in the name of Murdo Fraser. I'm sure we'll uh, speak eloquently to those. Um, I'll speak solely uh, for the interest of time to my three amendments in this grouping, uh, 33 and 30. Uh, 33 uh, is, uh, in, in essence, uh, adding uh, exemptions uh, uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, entry into low emission zones. And this is simply to allow uh, emergency services to enter and eg exit the low emission zones without incurring fees. Um, the amendment proposes that we exempt police uh, uh, who enter the zones for official purposes, ambulances carrying out their functions, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, and Her Majesty's Coast Guard. Uh, the wording of these amendments has been taken from another part of the bill, almost verbatim. Uh, the exemptions offered uh, and enjoyed in part four of the bill on pavement parking, I feel should also be uh, enjoyed by the same bodies in this part of the bill. I hope the Minister will find these reasonable requests. Uh, it seems only right to give these types of vehicles exemption to allow them to enter the zones as required until such times, hopefully, as they operate fully compliant fleets, but in the occasion that they may not. Uh, I hope this gives them uh, some comfort. Uh, the next amendment um, uh, uh, it, it, it perhaps may strike some as an odd one, uh, but let me explain to the Minister and the Committee why I have included the exemption of a diplomatic vehicle. <clears throat> Members may or may not be aware, but when the congestion charge was introduced in London, uh, foreign diplomats argued that it was a tax and therefore, uh, under the 1961 Vienna Convention, they were exempt from paying it. Um, lo local authorities believe that this was a charge and that the diplomats should have to pay to enter the zone. Uh, as of May 2019, it is estimated that the UK Treasury has owed more than £116 million in unpaid fees. This resulted in a very lengthy, uh, often amusing and at times very public, uh, dispute between local authorities, uh, which bore quite substantial legal costs. Um, for the local authority concerned. Uh, in order to avoid this dispute occurring north of the border, I think we should simply decide whether or not we believe that these types of vehicles should be exempt from the emission zone or not. I have no preference or view on it, but I have included the amendment that we should indeed settle the matter uh, by making it clear whether they are in or out. I hope the government will give it. I am happy to, yes. The member says he has no view one way or another, yet he submitted an amendment. Is that his position? Yes, absolutely. Let me explain why, Mr Finney, uh, because <clears throat> I think it's for the government uh, to take a view on whether they think these types of vehicles are or not exempt from, from paying the fees. Or, uh, what I'm trying to avoid is that we don't end up in a situation where there's ambiguity and that uh, people are arguing that the fines should not be paid. OK, the scale of it in London was different. There are far more vehicles to which this relates. And, of course, the scale of the fines were fairly substantial and unpaid fines to the local authorities there. Um, uh, but this, uh, the purpose of the amendment is to give the uh, government the opportunity to reflect on the, the issue uh, and take a view on it. Um, and I'm, I'd be interested to hear the Minister's response in that respect. And my final amendment uh, here is uh, related to time-limited exemptions. Uh, and I'm hoping the uh, purpose of this amendment is uh, to give the uh, government the opportunity to uh, perhaps explain more what they think the practical applications of time limit exemptions are. Uh, when we re reviewed the bill, uh, section 18 around temporary suspension for events seems very logical and clear. 
Um, but it was unclear to, to many of us what the time-limited exemptions could or would be used for, and for that reason why it required a one-year cap. Uh, so by removing uh, the cap in this amendment, I'm hoping it will prompt uh, some clarity uh, in the debate as to what the purpose of a time-limited exemption is, and indeed the government's thought logic behind the one-year cap, and perhaps then the committee can take an informed, an informed view as to whether there is a need for a one-year cap or not. Thank you, uh, Jamie. Richard Lyle, can I ask you to speak to Amendment 2, please, and other amendments in the group? Richard. Yes. Uh, firstly, convener, I have to record that I am the convener of the cross-party group for the Scottish section of the Showman's Guild. I move the amendments in my name. I am in support of the introduction of low emission zones in, in cities, towns, villages where, where required, but I have tabled this amendment on behalf of the Scottish section of the Showman's Guild due to the fact that their members may have to drive through an emission zone to erect a fun fair at certain times of the year. And before anyone asks me what is a fun fair, here is the Oxford Dictionary definition. A fair consisting of rides, sideshows and other amusements. Due to the type of equipment that a showman has to erect, their vehicle can be very large and mostly will be a, a, a diesel vehicle. Showmen have central, central certain types of vehicles which are not on the road every day of the week, so they may keep their vehicle longer than most companies, therefore they may not comply to low emission standards. Showmen have been allocated exemptions in most low emission zones in England, and a quote from the Transport of London website. Showmen's vehicles are eligible for a 100% discount from LEZ daily charge if they are registered to a person following the business of a travelling showman. For the vehicle to be eligible for the discount, it must be used for a performance, used for the purpose of providing the performance and used for carrying out the performance equipment. In Amendments 3, 3 and 3A, these amendments specify that an authority must grant an exemption to showman's vehicles which have been driven through a low emission zone to set up or dismantle a fun fair. A showman may have, ha have several pieces of equipment to take to the fairground but has to transport each ride separately. Therefore, he or she may go through the zone on the same day, towing one piece of equipment one way, but coming back through the zone with no equipment attached. He or she may go through the zone on many occasions, as that is why I have amended Amendment 3 and added Amendment 3A in order to cover that particular fact. Again, I raise the fact that low emission zones in England have granted showmen and the persons who are employed in the direction of fun fairs a 100% discount from LEZ charges. Uh, in regards to other uh, amendments in the group, uh, unfortunately, I can't support any of them. Oh. Well, they. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Mr. Lau. Uh, Murdo Fraser, can I ask you to speak to Amendment 30 and any other amendments in the group? Murdo. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Convener. Um, like other members, I'm supportive of the principle of LEZs, uh, but my Amendment uh, 30 is intended to exempt historic vehicles from the rules around uh, LEZs, a historic vehicle being defined as any vehicle constructed more than 30 years before 1st January in the year which it is driven within an LEZ. And the Second Amendment 31 extends this provision to vehicles from other countries which meet the same criteria. Um, I should say I have a personal interest in historic vehicles as the owner of a classic car and a member of the Stag Owners Club. And I'm grateful to the Federation of British Historic Vehicle Clubs for their assistance in drafting these amendments and making the arguments. And I know their members have been uh, energetically lobbying MSPs on this issue over the last uh, few days. The uh, FBHVC is an umbrella group which represents over 540 member clubs throughout the United Kingdom, which have a total membership of over a quarter of a million historic vehicle owners and enthusiasts. Interest in historic vehicles sustains economic activity worth £5.5 billion annually to the UK economy and supporting the employment of nearly 35,000 people spread right across the country. Historic vehicles include cars, motorcycles, buses, coaches, lorries, vans, military vehicles, tractors and steam engines. These are vehicles no longer used primarily, if at all, as a means of transportation, but are preserved and in many cases have been restored for their historic interest. Their owners exhibit them uh, at exhibitions, at shows, community fets uh, and so on. Uh, and these vehicles have to use the highways both in order to attend at these events but also to participate in touring events 
and for general leisure purposes. Without an exemption from LEZs, individuals with, living within an LEZ would not be able to own or operate a historic vehicle, which would be, in my view, an unreasonable restriction. Moreover, it would mean that historic vehicles would no longer be able to drive through an LEZ, which would mean that historical vehicle exhibitions, rallies and events could no longer be held at such venues. These events are popular with the public and have a major economic benefit, and I feel it would be an unintended consequence of the introduction of LEZs if historic vehicles were to be excluded in this fashion. Two other brief examples, Convener. Uh, one is around military vehicles. Today is the 75th anniversary of D-Day. As part of that, we are seeing a parade of historic military vehicles uh, down uh, on the south coast. Now, if we don't exempt historic vehicles from LEZs, we will not be able to have parades of historic mil military vehicles down Princes Street and down other streets in the centres of our cities. And the other example is, is wedding cars. People like turning up for their weddings in a historic Rolls-Royce or Daimler bedecked with ribbons. Um, if we don't exempt historic vehicles from LEZs, it means you won't be able to turn up for your wedding in a city centre church or hotel or wedding venue uh, in such style. And I think that would be uh, to the detriment of uh, society as a whole and, and not what was intended by the legislation. Now, it goes without saying that the great majority of historic vehicles, if not all, will not meet modern emission standards. And it will therefore be the case that there will be higher pollution from a historic vehicle uh, in an LEZ than from a more modern vehicle. But we have to put this into perspective. Historic vehicles are seldom in regular use and tend to do a very low mileage, commonly no more than a few hundred miles per year. In total, historic vehicles represent just 0.2% of total traffic on UK roads. So I do not think there is a credible argument that there is a substantial pollution problem likely to arise from exempting historic vehicles, given uh, how little they contribute to overall traffic. My amendment seeks to exclude all historic vehicles uh, registered more than 30 years ago on a rolling basis. The Vehicle Excise and Registration Act 1994 describes historic vehicles as those at least 40 years old on a rolling basis. It is this definition which is used by DVLA, and currently all vehicles more than 40 years old are exempt from road tax and annual MOT. However, the international definition of historic vehicles applies to those built more than 30 years ago. This is the definition recognised by UNESCO and FIVA, which is the International Umbrella Organisation for Historic Vehicle Owners. Accordingly, in line with international practice, I believe that the 30-year cut-off point is the appropriate one. There is convener precedent for what I am proposing here. The LEZs that exist in England, both the London ULEZ and the other zones being set up pursuant to DEFRA's Clean Air Framework, all exempt historic vehicles. So, in line with this, I believe it would be appropriate for historic vehicles to be exempted from the LEZs to be established in Scotland. I hope that this is helpful, convener. I am happy to answer any questions or respond to any points uh, members wish to make. And I move Amendment 30. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Cabinet Secretary. Can I ask you to speak to Amendment 56 and other amendments in the group, please? Uh, thank you, Convener. I'm aware that the issue of uh, proposed LEZ exemptions is one where we have heard a lot of views uh, over Stage 1, and there have been some interesting additions to that uh, from members around the table this morning. Let me be clear. I'm, I absolutely accept that there will be vehicle-based exemptions in relation to LEZs. There are a range of circumstances where it would be right and proper that certain vehicles, uh, for the purposes that they are being used for, uh, would just justify an LEZ exemption. During government evidence over stage one, it was made clear that areas such as emergency services and blue badge holders were high up in our considerations. And there have been some interesting proposals tab tabled today in relation to quite niche areas for example, Amendment 2, 3 and 3A relates to the transportation uh, equipment for funfairs. Amendment 30 and 31 are concerned with historic vehicles, whilst Amendment 221 relates to community bus services. Amendment 33 uh, covers blue light services, uh, service first responders, and Amendment 34 concerns diplomatic vehicles. What is evident from such a wide variation of interests is that this all needs some careful thought and consideration in conjunction with interested parties with specialist knowledge in these areas. 
I do not think it would be in our collective interests to arbitrarily extend exemptions to, in some areas, quite nuanced groups of vehicles at stage two. My officials are presently undertaking an extensive amount of engagement in relation to proposed regulations on LEZ exemptions. We do not want to preempt that process. Stakeholders, I am happy to take an intervention from Mr. Uh, Lyle. I know under the, the bill, and this may uh, be a, an answer to everyone's, including my uh, proposal. A low emission time limited exemption, a low emission zone scheme may provide for the granting and renewal by the local authority which made the scheme of a time limited exemption in respect of a vehicle or type of vehicle for the purpose of section. Would the council or local council, where there is a, an LEZ if approached by historic vehicles, uh, community but, uh, transport, um, the showman's guild, uh, if there was a, 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 a uh, a function on that day, could the, the local council grant an exemption for that particular time, day, or extension of the fair, fun fair, or uh, a show uh, uh, historic vehicles going down Princess Street? So there is provision within the legislation that a, a local authority can uh, suspend the provisions of an LEZ within that particular uh, uh, within the particular area that it covers uh, for an event to take place. So if it was a parade of historic uh, military uh, vehicles, then they would be able to suspend it for the purposes of that. Then there's provision within the legislation to do that. However, as I mentioned. Uh, convener, uh, my officials have been undertaking an extensive amount of work with the uh, interested parties in this matter. Uh, there was a stakeholders workshop hosted by Transport Scotland on the topic of regulations, including the very issue of exemptions, uh, and that uh, took place last month. And a detailed report on the findings of the workshop will be published shortly. Uh, this approach is helping us to gather a full picture from key interest groups and to properly test opinion in a considered forum. I'm more than happy to update Parliament on how this is developing as we move towards stage three, but we need to give this process some space to develop and to avoid taking forward uh, the issue of exemptions on a piecemeal fashion. On the amendments not relating to uh, vehicle type amendments 56 and 57, uh, we, they have been lodged by the government to address issues raised with us over stage one. In the event of uh, unavoidable road closures, which may divert traffic into an LEZ, it would not, be, would not seem appropriate for a registered keeper of a non-compliant vehicle to receive a penalty when they had no alternative but to enter the LEZ. Furthermore, Amendment 56 allows local authorities to create time-limited exemptions for such a scenario. However, the amendment has been drafted to ensure the exemption would only apply if the driver entered the LEZ following a signed diversion. The LEZ for Cities Consistency Group comprises of representatives from Aberdeen, Dundee, Edinburgh and Glasgow. It's made it known to my officials that it would not be desirable for the appeals process to be used for such a scenario. Its primary function should be kept for reviews or appeals in connection with the alleged erroneous issuing of a penalty charge notice. Therefore, we have acted on this matter. Amendment 57 is consequential to Amendment 56 and allows local authorities uh, to make time-limited exemptions for road closures to make those exemptions subject to conditions or restrictions. Amendment 203 also concerns time-limited exemptions. It aims to remove the one-year uh, time limit for time-limited exemptions other than those for road closures, leaving this open-ended. I think a time limit is appropriate here to make clear such exemptions should not carry on indefinitely and to encourage fleet operators in particular who do receive a time limited exemption to still prepare for LEZ compliance in the quickest time possible. I ask the committee, I am happy to give way to uh, Mr Green. Uh, thank you to the Government Secretary for taking my intervention and finding this uh, extremely helpful and useful. But I think uh, and it is related to the permanent exemptions uh, and my amendment uh, 203 and time limited. Isn't the point that Mr Law was making that the legislation already allows for exemptions to be made to cover specific events, either under time limited exemption or temporary suspension for an event? But the point of 
uh, Mr Fraser's, Rachel Hamilton's and indeed my own amendments uh, and uh, of course some of Mr Lyle's is to give permanent exemption to certain categories, not time limited. So by re either removal of the, the cap on the time limited exemption or by giving permanent exemption on the face of the bill, as is done uh, on page uh, 57 and parking prohibitions, where we do, and the government in its own bill specifies these groups of vehicles and, and is happy to do so in that section, but seems unhappy to do it in this section. I'm a bit confused. Perhaps you could clarify the matter for me. Yeah, I, I can see where your confusion is, is because the exemptions will be dealt with by regulation. So, and uh, what we're undertaking just now is to bring together all of the issues relating to exemptions uh, uh, so that they are based in regulation, which will be taken forward through an affirmative procedure, which Parliament will then have to approve. So, rather than doing it in a piecemeal fashion by introducing elements onto the face of the bill itself. The issue around uh, local authorities being able to suspend the provisions around uh, 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 an LEZ is for, ex for the purpose of a major event that may be taking place uh, that would involve uh, bringing in vehicles which would not comply with the LEZ. Uh, and it's to give local authorities some flexibility in that. However, uh, what we do believe is that there should be a time limit on uh, the length of time that they can suspend it for uh, to ensure that it doesn't get suspended indefinitely. And that's to uh, address the very issue which I was just mentioning in my contribution. I hope that's clarified the issue for, the, uh, for the member. Uh, convener, uh, I'd ask the committee to support Amendment 56 and 57 in my name, and I'd ask Richard Lyle, Muddle Fraser, Jamie Green and Rachel Hamilton not to press their amendment in this group, but if pressed, I would therefore urge the committee to reject them. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Now, there are a number of committee members who wish to come in on this. Could I remind committee members that it is... Uh, very helpful to be succinct and to the point, which means that I then don't have to time limit uh, the the amount of time they have to speak. So let's try that on a gentle way first of all. Stuart Stevenson followed by Colin Smith. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Amendment uh, 221 uh, from Rachel Hamilton in relation to community bus services. Um, I absolutely share with her a desire to support community bus services uh, to the best possible way we can. And indeed, on the 15th of March 2006, I had a members' debate uh, on the subject. And it's worth just repeating some of the stats I used then. That that relate to Aberdeenshire, where 44% of passengers have to wait more than 64 minutes for a bus, while another 15% of passengers have to walk more than 14 minutes to a bus stop. So community bus is a very important part of rural transport infrastructure. However, um, I, um, I want to be quite clear that I think uh, people who use community bus services are as entitled as anyone else to use um, modern, efficient, comfortable uh, transport. And indeed, uh, community bus services, uh, which on occasion will travel significant distances to go to events in cities and so on and so forth, um, should not be uh, a way in which people are exposed to pollutants that may come from rather old vehicles. So I just leave that statement to all while making the general point. Um, amendment uh, 33 uh, from Jamie Green. Um, I think th there's an omission uh, from the list that he proposes, which I can perhaps explain, and that is I would imagine if you're going to have a list like this, you might include military vehicles, because there will be occasions, uh, albeit that I suspect that military vehicles are covered by Crown immunity and wouldn't necessarily uh, require to be no, on such... Well, I'll come in a minute, if I may. Uh, no, I will. I'll take it now. Sorry. It's on that specific point. Um, the, I, I appreciate the omission of military vehicle, which actually... I, as I referred to, part four of the bill does, is included. But wouldn't the member therefore agree that uh, you have the ability between now and stage three to add uh, a suitable vehicle type if it was deemed to be uh, omitted from my amendment? And by putting this wording in on the face of the bill as it is in another part of the bill, it will give members the opportunity to, to amend or add as they see fit. 
Well, I, th th thank you for that. I've listened carefully to what the Minister has to say about dealing with this through regulations, and I think that is a much more flexible way of dealing with lists in the generality of how we legislate. So I'm, I'm pretty much persuaded by that. Uh, let me move on to uh, Jamie Green's uh, Amendment 34, Diplomatic Vehicles. It may be worth saying that under the Diplomatic Code, and I've read this of the, of the United States uh, government website, um, Diplomatic Vehicles may may be issued with traffic citations. In other words, they are not exempt uh, from the laws. And not only that, the diplomatic code makes it clear that the state can intervene for reasons of public safety. And in relation to pollution, I think there is hardly a more omnipresent and regular threat to public safety than pollutants. So it, it, it would be entirely inappropriate to embed in um, it, primary legislation a specific exemption for diplomatic vehicles, which we expect to set an example to everyone in our community and behave and perform to the highest standards. So I would, I would not under any circumstances support that. Now, Mr Fraser, uh, I um, welcome his explanation of the 30 years because I was aware of the 40 years. Of course, for him personally, uh, since the last Triumph Stag was manufactured in 1977, or some websites say 1978. Uh, they're all more than 40 years old either way. Um, I didn't think the 30 years was proper on the face of the bill as any number, because if we're to do it, I think we should link it to something else. And were we to support this amendment, I would prefer to see it linked to the exemption from vehicle excise duty so that when and if that changes, it carries with it changes on this. But that's a drafting issue um, uh, rather than anything else. Like others, I've been contacted by the Bon Accord Steam Engine Club of Aberdeen and indeed... Mr Stevenson, um, well, I've, I've got I, I absolutely understand this, but, but I, I'm just saying I understand you've got a lot to get through. I have a lot of people to get through. So if I could ask you to be succinct on each well, point, I'm I trying, would be grateful. Yeah. Well, you've had five minutes so far. No, no, so. but there are a lot. I've spoken of four amendments so far, convener. No, five minutes on this amend, on, on this section. So, Mr. Stevenson. Yeah, but there are amendments. No, Mr. Stevenson, I, I'll, I'll let you continue, but I ask you to be brief. Right. Well, the, 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 the point is well made on uh, steam engines. And I think, uh, concluding on this amendment, I think the one point that uh, Mother Fraser has made, uh, which perhaps I haven't heard the answer to, is people who own a historic vehicle and live within an emission zone. And I think there is something to be dealt with there, while the rest of perhaps uh, what he says, I think, can uh, sensibly uh, be dealt with elsewhere. That's it, convener. Good, thank you. Uh, Colin, followed by uh, John Mason. Thank you, uh, convener. For the purposes of, of simplicity, simplicity uh, and effectiveness of LEZs, I, I think exemptions should, and the point of principle, be kept to a minimum. I'm also, I have to say, uncomfortable with the idea of the bill permanently exempting any type of, of vehicle. This legislation is expected to be in place for the foreseeable future, uh, and most, uh, although I appreciate not all of the vehicles being suggested for exemptions here, are capable of being LEZ compliant eventually, even if they do face particular challenges in the short term. Uh, I have to say I do accept, however, that the exemptions um, that are being proposed do have merit, uh, but ministers um, already have the power to regulate to exempt vehicles or types of vehicles, and in many ways I think maybe secondary legislation may be the more appropriate place to put these exemptions so they can be revoked if they do become unnecessary, uh, not least because we should be trying to support people and organisations to allow them to upgrade their vehicles um, rather than exempting them. In, in terms of amendments 13 and 31 uh, on, on the specific issue of classic vehicles, I do appreciate there is a unique challenge here in that replacing or upgrading these cars uh, or vehicles is not an option in the same way as it may be in other instances. Um, but I wonder whether, uh, as the Cabinet Secretary says, um, the way forward is to have something targeted uh, in, in regulations to allow classic vehicles to be driven, for example, for specific purposes such as a, a classic car show uh, or, or an ex exemption in regulation for a resident, for example, with an LEZ within, sorry, with a, a classic vehicle within an LEZ. And, and, and I would just make the general point that I think regulation is the best way forward when it comes to, to these exemptions. And we should not be putting these exemptions in the face of the bill. Thank you, Colin. Uh, John Mason, followed by Mike Rumbles. Uh, thanks, convener. I mean, I think the Cabinet Secretary's comments have been helpful and certainly clarified things a bit for me. 
Um, I mean, I feel there's two main issues here. One is that should there be exemptions for some vehicles all of the time, which I think is what Murdo Fraser is kind of arguing for, and also the whole question of time-limited events, which is actually covered in Section 12 of the Bill. Um, I have a specific interest in my constituency in having a bus museum, uh, and they would consider 20 years to be when a bus becomes a vintage bus. So they would argue with the 30-year line uh, which has been taken by Murdo Fraser. Uh, but I'm happy to accept that it would not be 20 years for every vehicle, but it uh, would be 20 for some. And I think that brings me to feel that, uh, yes, we do not want, as has just been said, uh, all of these details in the face of the bill. Whether, though, maybe we need some reference in the face of the bill to this kind of exemption, uh, because there is the very specific section 12 about time-limited exemptions, but I don't think there's an equivalent for uh, certain types of vehicle, albeit these would be uh, in regulations. Um, I mean, I think we do need to remember as well that the, these low emission zones are intended to be quite tight and small areas. And I would have thought that uh, some of Murdo Fraser's arguments about a vehicle having to travel through Glasgow, it would not have to go through the LEZ to be able to go through Glasgow. Um, so I think. Uh, that is an issue, and also that I mean the likelihood of somebody living in the small LEZ in Glasgow and actually having a, a vintage vehicle as well, I think is pretty unlikely. But uh, I'm not saying it's absolutely impossible. Uh, yes, okay. Um, I wonder if Mr. Mason could reflect upon the point I made about wedding cars. Do you not think it would be unfortunate for someone wanting to get married at a city centre church in Glasgow to have to rock up in a modern car as opposed to a vintage Rolls Royce? Well, th that brings up my final point, which is uh, uh, how cumbersome the council system of a time-limited exemption would be if it's quite straightforward and could easily cover Mr Fraser's example and mine of a bus uh, going into the city centre to pick up passengers to take to the museum, which might happen, say, 15 times a year at the most. Uh, often these are run by volunteers or small businesses, so I would hope that uh, any system the Council's put in place uh, would be a fairly simple system. Thank you. Thank you. John, uh, Mike Rommels. Thank you, convener. Um, my first contribution this morning. Um, we have a climate emergency. I'm surprised we haven't flagged that up, and that's uh, partly why we're looking at low emission zones. So, as a matter of course, I'm not in favour of general exemptions to this. Um, the whole point is that where you are able to, and I'll come to Murdo's amendments in a minute, where you are able to move to low emission uh, vehicles, then that's the whole point of a low emission zone. So when you exempt vehicles from that, that causes a problem. So, however, I'm looking at amendments 56 and 57 from the government, and it seems to me a very sensible situation where if someone has no intention of going into the uh, low emission zone area and are forced into it, then it seems eminently sensible that we have a situation where they are not uh, breaking the law, because that's what we're talking about. Unlike London, where there's a charge, we have decided in Scotland to go down the route of where this is not a charge, this is the law. Um, so that, and to me, is very sensible, 56 and 57. Um, I have to say, uh, I'm not a fan, like um, Colin Smith, of government regulations. I think it's our job as uh, MSPs to, when we're looking at primary legislation, to get it right. Uh, so I, I am well aware that um, the minister will have the opportunity under this, uh, under the law, uh, and section 14B, the Scottish ministers may, by regulation, specify vehicles or types of vehicle which are exempt. So. The minister is going to have that power. The problem with regulations, when it comes before us, we can't amend them. So we can amend primary legislation, which is before us. So I understand why Murdo Fraser has brought the particular amendments on classic cars. I'll hold my hands up. I used to have a classic car. I don't want any more. So I'm not. Uh, I don't have an interest in that regard. Uh, pecuniary interest in that regard. Um, but I do understand. I mean, classic cars can't, we can't change the classic car for the low emission zone. So there is, a, there is an issue here. But what, I, what I'm worried about is an issue of process. I would like to address this in stage one of the committee's proceedings. We didn't do it because that wasn't made, brought to our attention at stage one. I, I think it really, we've missed a trick uh, in not examining this in detail. So we're being asked to vote 
on Murdo Fraser's amendments, having not taken evidence, having not examined the situation, um, I think he, there is a case to be made for this, on this at stage three on the face of the bill, and I would urge um, Murdo Fraser to have discussions with the Cabinet Secretary on this issue of classic cars, because it, it is an issue. I would hope that apart from the government's amendments of 56 and 57, all the other amendments uh, would not be pressed. So we can have a look at this at better detail at stage three. I will certainly support amendments 56 and 57. I'm not going to support the other amendments. I'm reserving our position on classic cars because I think there is something about this that we need to examine further. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Peter Chapman. Thanks, convener. I will be very brief. I am also a collector and owner of classic cars, and I therefore support Murdo Fraser's amendments 3031 to exempt classic cars from LEZs. And since he's made the case very well, I, won't, I will only add that classic car rallies are a great cultural event, and it is important that we do not ban them from our towns and cities. And we must remember as well that these, these classic cars do very small mileages on an annual basis. Uh, I also support the amendments by my colleagues, uh, Rachel Hamilton and uh, Jamie Green. And I will stop there, convener. Hmm. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, Rachel Hamilton, can I ask you to wind up and press or withdraw your amendment, please? Thank you, convener. Whilst I accept the Cabinet Secretary's wish to deal with uh, the exemptions through regulation, I do not accept the Cabinet Secretary's uh, comment that community transport is a niche area. Community bus operators are not well placed to embrace technology and offer an integral service to vulnerable individuals in local communities and those living in social isolation. There will be an opportunity, of course, for members to add to my amendment at stage three, and I move my I press my amendment in my name. Thank you. Uh, therefore, we, uh, the question I'm going to ask is that Amendment 221 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There therefore will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against? Thank you. The result of that vote is there are four votes for, seven votes against. Therefore, the amendment is not carried. I therefore call Amendment 33 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 221. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. I therefore call Amendment 34 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 221. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Not move. Not moved. I therefore call Amendment 2 in the name of Richard Lyle, already debated with Amendment 221. Richard Lyle, to move or not move? Move. The question, therefore, be, it be that Amendment 2 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There is, therefore, a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against... Can you make sure, sorry, committee members, just keep your hands right up? And those who abstain? Sorry. C can we please, we're just going The result of that vote is there are five votes for, there are five against, votes against, there's one extension, uh, abstention. Therefore, I have the casting vote, and I will do, as I always do, is cast my vote in the way that I did originally. Therefore, that means the amendment is carried. Uh, we therefore move on to Amendment 30 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with Amendment 221. Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Thank you, Commissioner. Can I respond very briefly to what we've heard? Uh, I'd just ask you to move or not move okay. the amendment. Well, given, given what the Minister has said in relation to further consideration, which I think is a very reasonable point, I'm happy to not move and reserve the right to bring this back at Stage 3. Thank you. I therefore call Amendment 31 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with Amendment 221. Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Not moved, Commissioner. 
Thank you. We're now going to move on to penalty charges payable, and I therefore call in low emission zones. I call Amendment 185 in the name of John Finney, Group with Amendments 186, 187, 188, 199, 200 and 202. I would like to point out that if Amendment 186 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendments 187 and 188. John Finney, please can you move Amendment 185 and speak to the amendments in the group? Uh, thank you, Convener. I, I do move Amendment 185, uh, which covers um, it's right up front in the Transport Bill, we're at uh, Part 1, Chapter 1, Section 1, and it is about um, the penalty charges. Um, and my proposal is, as things stand at the moment, the charges want only one, and I quote here, only one penalty charge is payable in respect of contributions. And my proposal is to move that to a three per day. Now, members um, will be aware that there are 40,000 deaths in the UK directly attributable to poor air quality each year. And uh, the British Lung Foundation, I think, have shared briefings widely with members and uh, they've expressed concerns about multiple contraventions, and I think people would understand this. So I'm very keen to hear what the Scottish Government have to say in respect of that. I, I, I anticipate they may talk about the potential for secondary legislation covering the, this matter, but um, I'm keen to hear that. There are other amendments in this group. I'll briefly talk about uh, Jamie Green's 186187. Uh, I, I won't be supportive <laughs> of these. Um, I'm keen to hear what Peter Chapman says about the, the data and vehicles, um, and uh, I'll decide thereafter. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Ms Finney. Jamie Green, can I ask you to speak to Amendment 186 and other amendments in the group, please? Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, let me uh, briefly explain. I think uh, there are two different sections of amendments, of, and the first one for preemption, and, and maybe if I explain my approach, it might help members understand why I've taken this approach. When I spoke to the legislation team, and I should put on record my huge thanks to them, they've been extremely helpful throughout this process. Navigating uh, these bills is, is complex and difficult uh, for, for members and their staff. And uh, for this reason, I've taken two approaches with 186 and 187 and 188. This is in relation for the benefit members on page two of the bill uh, uh, on uh, the uh, the Scottish ministers made by regulations and subsection 4C uh, says, and it is helpful to read it, make provision for and, and in connection with the amount that may be imposed as a penalty charge under subsection 2, which may include provision for discounts and surcharges. Now, 186 proposes simply to remove 4C uh, in its entirety, the reason being that it, it was my view that ministers should not dictate the amount of the penalty charges and that would be best placed to give local authorities. Uh, that power. Uh, 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 so that's uh, the approach that 186 takes. Um, the approach that 187 and 188 takes, however, is, is different, uh, and I'd be keen to hear uh, members' thoughts on this. And 187 gives ministers the power to set a maximum penalty charge, but not specify a range or a minimum. And the reason for that is that my view is it seems sensible for government to specify the top end of what a charge could be to ensure that there is some form of consistency and fairness right across Scotland, regardless of where you live. But in my view, it was local authorities that should determine the penalty that best meets the needs for their city and their zone. 188 removes the Minister's ability to determine discounts and surcharge levels, in line with my theory that uh, the government's intervention on the amount of fines, discounts and surcharges should again be down to the local authority running the scheme and not central government. The reason for that is because it, what is right for Dundee to charge may not necessarily be right for Edinburgh to charge. Uh, the reason, however, I would like a, a national cap uh, uh, on the amount charged is to ensure that any one individual local authority uh, is not uh, able to introduce uh, overly exuberant fines that could range in the hundreds of pounds per day. We simply do not know at this stage. Uh, so that's the rationale between those two approaches. Um, amendments 199 and 200 are uh, very similar. 200 uh, would reflect um, the passing of uh, Amendment 187 around uh, the maximum charge, so it's technically different from 199, and, and, and I'll take a view on which one uh, to move in that respect. But in effect, it says that when setting up a zone, 
uh, in section 9, which lists what local authorities should detail when setting up a zone, uh, including the geographic area of a zone, uh, the, which roads it will operate on, the date in which it will come into effect, the objectives and so on and so on. Uh, I've added the amount that has be, to be imposed as a penalty charge. It doesn't specify what that amount should be on the face of the bill. I think it's entirely correct not to do so. But it does state that in se the required content of a scheme should include at the outset, when a local authority comes to ministers to request a scheme, uh, that those local authorities detail what the penalty charges they propose will be as part of the setting up of that scheme. It seems uh, a sensible uh, thing to request them to do. Amendment 202, which is also in this group, I'll briefly speak to. Uh, as the bill currently stands, individuals are responsible for meeting the costs of a penalty charge. Uh, this amendment uh, technically allows uh, other methods of payment. It would, for example, allow a company or organisation to set up an arrangement where they pay the charge uh, uh, on behalf of their employees, for example. Uh, to give uh, some examples to this, which may be helpful uh, to the committee, um, an NHS board, for example, may choose to enter into an arrangement with the local authority who operates the scheme to meet the costs of uh, individual drivers, for example, doctors or nurses, who travel into an, uh, a zone. Uh, similarly, a local authority might use a range of contractors to provide services, such as, uh, as is common, outsourced waste collection. Uh, and part of that agreement, a uh, commercial agreement between those parties, uh, may be that the cost of non-compliant vehicles entering a zone may be met by the local authority or in any, any other body, and this would allow them to do so, whereas at the moment the bill puts the onus on the driver personally. Yeah, on of that course, point. Yes. Um, uh, it's an interesting principle. I wonder if Mr. Green's reflected whether that could apply to other sort of criteria covered by the law, for instance, the workplace parking levy. Would uh, you be bringing forward an amendment of that nature in respect of that? Uh, I think when we get to that stage, I'll be very happy to have that debate with Mr. Finney, but at the moment I'm talking about low emission zones, uh, and I think this is a sensible and helpful suggestion uh, to allow uh, organisations to enter into uh, an agreement with the local authority that operates. A zone. Similar measures have actually been brought in in other congestion zones, where, for example, companies have set up direct debits uh, to meet the costs or other forms of more simple payment. Uh, the, the amendment does not mandate local authorities to set up bulk payment schemes uh, in any way, shape or form, but it does give them the power to do so if they choose to do so, and I'd be keen to hear uh, the Minister's thoughts on that amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've got Mike Rumbles. Uh, Mike. Th thanks, Convener. Um, I do think uh, John Finney's amendment at 185 is too harsh. I think people can enter a, a zone inadvertently, uh, and if they enter it once and be charged for that day, that, that, that should be sufficient. I'm not convinced that um, moving it to three will, will, will have any effect um, on, on changing behaviour, which is what we're talking about. So I think that's what the Minister's position, of course. I'm grateful for the member taking intervention. Does the member think it's likely that someone would inadvertently enter it three times a day? Well, I can only speak from personal experience, uh, and, and I'll say yes, because mm. I have been abroad where I've inadvertently entered a zone where I really I shouldn't have been, and I knew it uh, if I'd known. Uh, uh, and so, yes, I mean, um, we can have drivers who make mistakes inadvertently, and we've got to legislate and be aware of that. So I hold my own hands up that from driving abroad. Um, I hope that answers... Oh, well, I'm not on that, I'm not. <laughs> but, but go on. <laughs> it, it's simply to state that, um, uh, that I have a, a further amendment come out, which we'll no doubt debate in due course, which is around signage, uh, and will produce very clear and standardised signage for en entering zones so that uh, drivers like Mr Rumbles will be acutely aware that they're entering a zone. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, can I continue? Yes, you, you may continue. Thank you very much and for that helpful intervention, uh, Jamie. Um, so, yes, the point is I'm about making sure that the whole point about this is to change behaviour. And I don't think it's any help for charging somebody up to three times for the same offence. So, sorry. Um, sec secondly, I do think Jamie, um, in his amends, misses the point about this. This, this is not a charge where some organisation can take pay for all the pay of the charge. It is a penalty. It is to prevent... It's our whole approach, the government's whole approach to this, <coughs> is about changing behaviour. It's not the fact that you can just pay the money and, you, and do it. It's meant to be a penalty. And I think 
from that perspective, I, I'm unlikely, unless I hear, unless the minister in his contribution convinces me otherwise, I'm likely to vote against all of these if they are pressed. Thank you. Uh, Rich Love, Richard. Yeah, I'm, I, I agree with Mike Rumbles. I actually remember um, when I used to work in Glasgow, uh, the City Council changed roads quite a number of times and inadvertently you, you uh, went into places that you shouldn't have went in and had to pay the, the cost of it. And, you know, so I believe that uh, charging someone three, and with the greatest respect to Jamie Green, sometimes you can, you know, if you're looking at the road and driving correctly, sometimes you can miss a sign, you know, uh, uh, and it does happen. So I, I, I agree with Mike Rumbles. I think one charge is enough. OK. Um, no other members want to seek forgiveness for previous crimes. So uh, we'll, we'll move to the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> Uh, convener, uh, this group of amendments addresses the penalty charge payable when the registered keeper of a vehicle is in contravention of a low emission zone. Amendment 185 increases the number of times in one day an individual can be charged for driving within a low emission zone in a non-compliant vehicle from one to three. It would appear that the intention behind this amendment is to further incentivise individuals not to be in contravention of an LEZ. It is correct that there must be a sufficiently stringent penalty to encourage behaviour change. However, a balance must be struck by having an incentive that is practical and technically deliverable. Issuing multiple penalties per day in the same LEZ to the same registered keeper would require the LEZ operator to prove that a vehicle had left an LEZ and then re-entered at a later time in the same day. And having consulted with stakeholders, uh, government has opted to set the bar at a maximum of one penalty charge per day. Amendment 186 and 119 have the effect that local authorities decide the penalty charge amount for their low emission uh, zone scheme and remove the powers for Scottish ministers to set nationally consistent penalty amounts in regulations. Amendment 187 and 188 and 200, by contrast, have the effect of retaining the Scottish Minister's ability to set the penalty charge, but provide that the Ministers are only setting the maximum charge. Ministers would have no power to set discounts and surcharges. Local authorities would have the power to specify the penalty charge, including any discounts and surcharges, but subject to the maximum charge set by Ministers. Neither of these options are advisable, as it is important to ensure that there is consistency in the penalty rates and surcharges set across all LEZ schemes. This issue around consistency is arguably one of the red line issues that stakeholders have called for. For this reason, I suggest it is sensible to have a standard amount that correlates to current civic penalty amounts and for the government to be able to set consistent surcharge rates so as to ensure that individuals across Scotland have certainty and consistency in understanding how they will be penalised for contravention. Happy to give way. I appreciate the, the time taken to, for my intervention. Is the, uh, is the Cabinet Secretary therefore uh, confirming that any emission zone that is set up in Scotland is that it is the government who will set the penalty charges, discount surcharges, and local authorities will have no ability to amend, review, change, lower, increase those amounts. And in other words, it is the government who will set the charges and not the local authority who operates the scheme. It is a nationally set uh, penalty charge in the same way it is for penalty charges for road traffic offences, which are set at a national level as well, so that we have consistency of approach. So if you face a penalty charge in Aberdeen, it will be the same penalty charge that you will also face in Glasgow for contravention, because the key issue that's been raised with us consistently by stakeholders is consistency of approach. And that's why we're taking an approach which allows ministers to set the penalty at a national level. Amendment 202 would allow local authorities to make arrangements with employers so as to exclude drivers from being charged a penalty for driving a non-compliant vehicle into an LEZ in the course of their employment. The Government agrees with this principle, but the amendment is unnecessary because the Bill already would allow for this. Section 24 prescribes that the penalty charge for entering an LEZ in a non-compliant vehicle is payable by the registered keeper of the vehicle. 
If an individual enters an LEZ in a non-compliant vehicle in the course of their employment, then the registered owner is likely to be the employer. This means that the employer is liable to pay the charge, not the employee. In the instance that an employee enters an LEZ in the course of their employment in a non-compliant vehicle that is registered to them, they would also be exempt from paying the charge by virtue of the regulation-making powers in Section 24B of the Bill. Therefore, convener, I cannot support Amendment 185, 186, 187, 188, 199, 200 and 202. And I would ask John Finney not to press Amendment 185 and Jamie Green not to press Amendment 186, 187, 188, 199, 200 and 202. But if they are pressed, I would therefore urge the committee to reject them. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, John Finney, can I ask you to wind up and press or withdraw um, your amendment? Thank you, Convener. Right. And, and I'm grateful for the Cabinet Secretary's comments, and I appreciate his, uh, 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 a considerable number of amendments to comment on. And his brief comment to mine, I'm sure, was not intended in any way to be dismissive of the British Lung Foundation's uh, considerable concerns about this. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary would be agreeable to, to a meeting with either himself or his officials to specifically address the concerns about multiple use that the British Lung Foundation ha have uh, um, raised. Uh, and if were that the case, then I, I, I certainly wouldn't be inclined to, to move the amendment. Uh, happy to have that engagement uh, um, with the member. OK, thank you very much indeed, Cabinet Secretary. I, I won't press the amendment. Thank you. OK, so the... Uh, question, therefore, is John Finney wishes to withdraw, withdraw Amendment 185. Does any member object? No. There are, there are no objections, therefore the amendment is withdrawn. Uh, I'm now going to, uh, we're now going to move on to a section on the identification of whether vehicle meets specified emission standards with, uh, within LEZs. And I'm calling Amendment 28 in the name of Graham Simpson, grouped with Amendments 222, 41, 42 and 29. Graeme Simpson, can I ask you to move, man, move Amendment 28 and speak to all the amendments in the group, please? Um, well, thanks very much, convener. Uh, this is a, a mercifully small group to deal with. Um, uh, this, uh, my, my amendment, which I'll, which I'll start with, well, there's a couple, in, a, a couple actually, but... Um, the main one is uh, 28. 29 uh, is a consequence of 28. Um, it's quite straightforward. I don't need to talk for very long about this. Um, I am, uh, seeing as people are putting their car ownerships on the table, I currently own a 13-year-old um, um, diesel car. I don't intend to hang on to it for too much longer. But uh, when I saw uh, the bill, it struck me that if I or anyone who owns a similar vehicle had work done to that vehicle, had it modified uh, so that it could comply uh, with the restrictions in, in one of these zones, then I, I would want that to be picked up quickly. So that if I had work done one day and I drove into a zone, let's say the next week, I wouldn't want to be getting fined. So the purpose behind the amendment was very simple. Uh, and that we need, we, we need to have a system, whatever it is, and I've, I've, I've said it should be done by regulation, that, that that kind of situation should be picked up. So if you have work done on a vehicle, there needs to be a system where that's recognised um, and that any, any low emission zone in Scotland would know that your vehicle uh, had had work done to it uh, and therefore complied. Um, looking at um, the amendments from... Peter Chapman and the Cabinet Secretary. I think they're pretty similar. I think they're going down the same vein. Um, I think they're complementary, but I remain to be persuaded that Mr Chapman or the Cabinet Secretary may persuade me that I don't need to press mine and that there's actually achieved the same things. Thank you. OK, but uh, on, on the outset, you're going to have to press your uh, your amendment, and yes. I don't think you said that you you were I, pressing it. I will press it. Oh, sorry, move it. I'll move Not it. Not press it. Moved it. Thank you, Peter Chapman. Can I ask you to speak to Amendment Two 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 and all the other amendments in the group, please, Peter? Thank you, Convener, and I will move uh, my amendment. Um, you don't do it. Yet. Don't do it yet. Okay. 
my amendment number 222. I, I think it, it, it uh, I echo the sentiments made by my colleague Graham Simpson and, and, and will support his amendments uh, if he pushes them. The, the onus must lie with the Scottish Government to identify which cars meet the required LEZ standards and not motors to manufacturers, which is basically what he was saying. And, and my amendment 222 goes a little bit further in this principle by ensuring that there is a, a national data set to identify which vehicles can and can't enter an LEZ. Now, just as the DVLA holds sets, uh, data sets for, for motorists to view different classifications of vehicles, there should, also, I would argue, be a data set for every motorist to check if their vehicle is up to requirements. Now, uh, this would be extremely beneficial in preventing confusion and penalties to drivers as they sim simply don't know which uh, category their, their vehicle uh, is in. Now, I, I think most cars will be simple to categorise, but there must also be a method to identify cars which have been modified so that they now meet the LEZ requirements. And that's what I would uh, suggest we should have a, a, a data set doing precisely that. Uh, I would also say I also support the Cabinet Secretary's amendments in this grouping, which are technical and strengthening to the certification of vehicles meeting LEZ standards. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, now I call on the Cabinet Secretary to speak to Amendment 41 and the other amendments in the group. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, convener, Amendment to 28 and 29 essentially duplicate powers already outlined in the Bill. The legislation already has provision for regulations identifying whether vehicles meet emission standards. Therefore, uh, these do not seem to offer anything additional and appear unnecessary. Amendment 222 requires Scottish Ministers, when making regulations under Section 14b, to include provision about national data set, which can be, which we, give, just finish this point, which can be used to identify vehicle exemptions. The outcomes sought by Amendment 222 are sensible, but the bill already makes provision for such actions to be delivered by allowing for the possibility for local authorities to contract out part of their function to LEZ operators. I'll give way to Mr Simpson. Uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. Uh, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary could point out the, se the section of the bill that he referred to earlier, which covers my amendment. It, the provisions within uh, the data sets that I've just made reference to, uh, which is the uh, making regulations under 14b, uh, the way in which you made a specific reference to the idea of a car being gone through a retrofit process, if it goes through a retrofit process, that needs to be notified to DVSA. Uh, uh, and that information, that data set, is used by those who are operating the LEZs uh, for, uh, for confirming whether cars comply with it or not. So, there's already, so the data sets which are used by DVLA and DVSA will be used by those who are operating LEZs. Uh, which covers the very point that the member uh, was seeking to uh, cover through his amendment. For LEZs to work properly, convener in Scotland, the LEZ enforcement regime will utilise data sets to identify exempt vehicles in order to deliver the purpose in section 11B. Uh, the data sets on exempt vehicles will be regularly updated, adapted and supplemented by other data sets or systems as applicable to permit the identification of exempt vehicles. Amendment 41 and 42 help address issues that have come to the fore since the Bill's introduction. They will help future-proof the legislation on LEZs to allow for situations whereby vehicle record data sets may change or new ones emerge and are used in the detection and enforcement scheme. Also, they will help ensure the detection scheme used in Scotland is flexible, in particular to take account of vehicle retrofitting, which means that it is important to enforce against emissions at the date and time of detection, rather than the emission performance when the vehicle was originally manufactured. Which addresses the very point that Mr Simpson was seeking to address to his amendment. Amendment 41 is principally aimed at addressing gaps in the records where no information is or will be held by DVLA or DVSA on the emission standard of a particular vehicle. This equates to records of future vehicle emission standards for vehicles which are different or more stringent than the current EU standard, 
also records of the emission standards for foreign vehicles, and finally, in relation to the application of so-called real-world emission standards, where a record of a vehicle's emission standards at the time of the contravention of the LEZ could help to show if the vehicle's emission standards has degraded below the standard for, with which it was registered. Amendment 42 ensures that if a vehicle has been retrofitted and the emission standards at the time of registration has changed, then the detection procedure will be flexible enough to be able to take account of this. In such an instance, the vehicle's registered keeper will have to ensure the designation is designated in such a way with DVSA. We understand that the agency intends to accept certificates currently produced by the Clean Vehicle Retrofit Certificate Certification System uh, run by the Energy Saving Trust in this regard. Therefore, this amendment allows, us for, allows for such back office functions and for the emissions at the date and time of detection uh, to be those that are pursued. Therefore, convener, I'd ask the committee to support amendments 41 and 42 in my name, and I'd ask Peter Chapman not to press amendment 222, and Graham Simpson not to press amendment 28 and 29. Uh, uh, if they are pressed, I would ask the committee to reject them. Thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, amendment 28 is um, not uh, constructed to, to meet its requirement because it uses the word manufactured. Uh, the definition of manufacture is to make something on a large scale using machinery. It therefore excludes home-built vehicles uh, from, the, uh, from the definition. Uh, the, the vehicles which traditionally had a year letter of Q, uh, which meant the year was indeterminate because often they were from parts of uh, many different vehicles. So I think just on technical grounds, it's, it's not a, a well-constructed amendment. Um, similarly, uh, for Peter Chapman's uh, 222, um, I'm, I'm a bit uncertain about paragraph B, other national or other system. Um, just what that ends up actually meaning, whether that's private data sets. What I would encourage the government to seek to be able to do is to have the information uh, recorded by the DVSA, if that's possible, uh, because they already record uh, the emissions that come from vehicles, and that determines uh, what the DVLA do in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the tax that's paid annually. In the case of my little hybrid car, I pay £10 a year. I know that other colleagues with large uh, Land Rovers pay considerably more because the database says their emissions uh, are, are greater. So hopefully we would piggyback on the back of that rather than setting up something which is disjoint and independent. Thank you. Uh, Stuart, Jamie Green. Thank you, Convener. Every day is a learning day when you sit next to Stuart Stevenson, um, Convener. Um, I, I, think, I, I think it's an interesting uh, chain of conversation. Uh, I think the points that Mr Simpson and Mr Chapman are trying to make is that we, the Bill talks in great detail about approved devices um, and uh, how the uh, information is captured in terms of uh, presumably number plate recognition. But I think what we haven't spent any time really discussing is what's at the back end of all that. And what are these connected to? And I, I think what this discussion is raising is, is seeking some clarity over whether local authorities will hold um, the data sets or the, the back end uh, data that the approved device is linked to to do that immediacy of checking of whether a vehicle that's been captured on entering a zone is compliant or non compliant uh, with entry. And whether or not that data set is held nationally or provided nationally, or indeed is set some national standard. And whether or not it's able to be amended by either adding layers of other data sets, for example, exemption layers, or indeed, as Mr. Simpson is alluding to, whether or not uh, it will capture changes or modifications to vehicles to have made them compliant. And I don't think, uh, and I think the problem that we have is that Amendment 42 uh, and, and uh, 41, whilst helpful, don't really clarify the issue as to whether or not um, there will be any standardised back-end data and whether all local authorities will use the same source of data or whether they will have to produce it themselves. And I think that's what, this, what these amendments are trying to, to elicit from the government. Um, if, if they're not moved, I'm hoping that that's something that the government may reflect on and, and confirm to us before stage three. Thank you, uh, Jamie. Uh, Graham Simpson, can I ask you to wind up and press or withdraw your amendment, please? 
Yeah, thanks, thanks, convener. Um, I, I've listened carefully to what the cabinet secretary had to say, uh, and indeed uh, Mr. Stevenson as well. Um, but if I take take the cabinet secretary's uh, opinion of the bill, and it is his opinion. Um, I'm not sure, having read the relevant section of the bill, that he actually that it actually captures what I'm trying to achieve uh, in Amendment 28, which is very simply, if you, if you have your car modified so that it can go into one of these zones, there needs to be a system that can react quickly to that so that people aren't getting wrongly fined. And, uh, and the Cabinet Secretary is looking puzzled by that, but um, I, don't, I don't really know why, because it's quite simple. If I take my car into a garage, get some work done to it so that you know, it, it will f meet these regulations, I don't want to be hit with a fine the, the, the very next week, yes. Is it, would, um, I wonder if the member would accept that the DVLA does actually update its records rel relatively quickly? I can accept that, but what, I'd, what I would want as a driver is the certainty that, that there is a system from garage to DVLA to council. And, and Mr. Mr. Ste Mr. Stevenson can wave his phone about as much as he likes. But this, uh, this, uh, hold on, hold, hold, hold on, please. No, no, cabinet, ca cabinet secretary, just two seconds. Can I just say that if, just to in situations like this where everyone wants to, to, to respond to Mr Simpson's comment. Could you actually ask a member and then look to me? I will call you in when there's three of you doing it at the same time. So, at, But it's up to, up to Mr Simpson to say whether he wants to give way. So, Mr Simpson, you, it, do you want to give way to the Cabinet Secretary? Um, I, d I don't wish to give way right. um, because I'm not actually going to uh, press the amendment because I think the... Um, <laughs> The uh, Cabinet Secretary's uh, amendments, uh, I think, having, having heard him, his amendments, now bear in mind he thought his bill was in good condition, um, his amendments to that, uh, I think, cover what I'm trying to achieve, so I won't be pressing it. Thank you. So, therefore, uh, as Graham Simpson wishes to withdraw Amendment uh, 28, does any member object? Okay, therefore the amendment is withdrawn. Uh, I therefore call Amendment 186 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 185. Sorry. Jamie Green to move or not move? Sorry, sorry would you mind, I, I remember speaking in my ear, would you mind repeating that for me for the benefit of the record? Yeah. So it's always good to listen to what the convener is saying, not other Try people around the table. So um, I'm calling Amendment 186 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 185. Jamie Green, would you move or not move it, please? Not moved. Therefore, I call Amendment 187 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 185. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Not moved. I therefore call Amendment 188 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 185. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Not moved, convener. Okay. The call Amendment 222 in the name of Peter Chapman, already debated with Amendment 28. Peter Chapman to move or not move? Not move. Okay. The question, therefore, at this stage is Section 1B agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Good. I will call Amendment 41 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 28. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question, therefore, is Amendment 41B are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I therefore call Amendment 42 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 28. Cabinet Secretary to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 42 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question now at this stage is that Section 2 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question now is Section 3 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. And that is the perfect moment to stop. Uh, and I'm going to suspend the uh, committee meeting uh, till uh, 20 past 11. Uh, and I will then ask, I would ask committee members and members, uh, the cabinet secretary, to back, be back in their seats by then to resume. So therefore, I'm temporarily suspending the meeting.
now going to reconvene the meeting uh, of the Royal Economy and Connectivity Committee considering the Transport Scotland Bill. We are now going to look at uh, the duty to make a scheme where certain air quality uh, is reached, and this is for low emission zones. Therefore, I'm going to call Amendment 43 in the name of Colin Smith on a group on its own. Colin Smith to mo move and speak to Amendment 43, please. Thank you, Convener. I am happy to move Amendment uh, 43 in my name, which requires local authorities with illegal levels of air pollution to introduce a low emission zone unless exempted by Minister. Simply put, this was drafted to make clear that when air pollution breaches legal levels, local authorities should be required to address this. Accountability for illegal air pollution largely lies with the UK Government. However, many of the solutions are at a local level. There should be a clear duty, in my view, on local authorities to deal with illegal air pollution in their area. Of the mechanisms currently available to local authorities or those expected to be made available through this bill, LEZs are widely considered to be the most effective way of reducing air pollution, so I believe this is the correct approach. However, this is not absolute. I have included in the option of a ministerial exemption. So, for example, if the breach in air pollution was clearly an anomaly or the local authority were able to illustrate how it is otherwise dealing with the issue, Scottish ministers would have the power to waive the requirement in my amendment. The introduction of LEZs in this section of the bill is an important step forward, but their use should not be optional where air pollution levels reach illegal levels, posing a serious threat to health. And I think this amendment clarifies it, which I am happy to move. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mike, Rumb Mike Rumbles, followed by John Finney. Th thank you. I am puzzled by um, Collins Amendment 43. On the one hand, I mean, the bill actually is an enabling bill allowing local authorities to do this and puts the initiative on local authorities. But in Collins Amendment 43, part 3, it says where at least a, a certain level a local authority must do this. And, but then in section 4, we have uh, an appearance of regulations again, allowing the Scottish Government to um, ignore that. So I don't really understand the entire purpose of this amendment, um, because it's saying on the one hand it must, and then on the other hand the Scottish Government mustn't, or it doesn't have to. So I, 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 I really don't think um, uh, amendment 43 does what Colin wants it to do. Thank you, Mike. Uh, John Finney. John. Uh, thank you, Convener. I, I think legislation can be very challenging. It's certainly challenging given all the papers we've got here to scrutinise it and make good law, because that's what we're, we're, we're here to do. I think one of the, the challenges the public faces, a lot of them are blissfully unaware that they live in areas where there are damaging levels of air pollution. Um, and um, it's, it's incumbent on government to protect its population, and whilst Colin's right to say um, some matters are reserved to the UK government, um, I'm, I'm very supportive of this um, um, provision. I, I think having assessed a risk and established that there is a, um, a danger to the public, then it's incumbent on the public sector to put in place measures to uh, ameliorate that risk. One of these measures is a low emission zone, and I support this amendment. Thank you. Thank you, John. Jamie Green. Jamie. Thank you, Convener. Um, can I just clarify, and perhaps Ms Smith can uh, uh, confirm it or not, and it's summing up, is, is the effect of this amendment simply that if air pollution levels fall below the standard specified, and he, he's uh, chosen the air quality standards regulation, other bits of the bill refer to other pieces of legislation. Indeed, I had some amendments which refer to different regulation. I think the problem here is that we are, are tying it to very specific regulation, which may change in the future, subject to the affirmative procedure. In effect, if the air quality is deemed to be uh, unfit for people in that zone, that the local authority in which that, that uh, measure is taken must introduce a low emission zone. Now, we think in low emission zones are primarily related to cities, rightfully so, where, where the majority of vehicles and traffic pollution is. Um, but in effect, this could be any local authority, including some of the local authorities in his own uh, region. Um, and this would, in, in effect, force them to set up a zone uh, perhaps even against its, its will. Um, and I appreciate the sentiment of this automatic trigger uh, of, of which she's trying to introduce, but I do have some nervousness that this would uh, mean that local authorities would have to set up a zone, even if it wasn't the right thing for them to do. Thank you. Um, uh, Peter Chapman. Peter. Yeah, um, I, I, I echo both of what Mike Rumbles has said and, and, and Jamie Green also. 
I mean, Mike Rumbles made the point that at one point it says a local authority must, and then at the other point it says, well, maybe they don't have to. So it, it, it's very confusing in, in that respect. And I also reflect on what Jamie Green has said, that this could force a local, a local authority in any area. I mean, LEZs are, as I understand them, are, are, are targeted at the four, four main cities. Now, this could open it up to, to any town anywhere, and uh, I think that would be a step too far at this stage. Thank you. Um, Cabinet Secretary. Convener, Amendment 43 would introduce a requirement on local authorities to implement an LEZ in an area that does not meet the air pollution limit values as set out in Air Quality Standards Scotland Regulations 2010. These regulations refer to air quality targets derived from European directives. This is important because LEZs in Scotland are being driven primarily by the need to address air pollution hotspots as defined by the Air Quality Scotland Regulations 2000 and not the European target outlined in Air Quality Standards Scotland Regulations 2010 as mentioned in Amendment 43. The Scottish Government has already given a commitment to introducing LEZs into air quality management areas identified under existing environmental legislation by 2023, where the National Low Emission Framework appraisals uh, support, uh, which supports this particular approach. These appraisals uh, will be conducted this year for all air quality management areas, other than the four main cities where LEZs are already being prepared. So this process will identify if an LEZ is required for other air, management, air quality management areas. It is important to consider carefully these appraisals and ensure there is scientific merit in introducing further LEZs as required. Thus, introducing this amendment as a mandatory requirement is too prescriptive at this stage, and the Scottish Government cannot support doing so before the appraisal takes place. But it is acknowledged that LEZs are a useful tool in improving air quality. Therefore, I would ask Colin Smith not to press this amendment. However, if he does so, it's for the committee to reject it. So I'm happy. I think, in fairness, John, he, he, he had said he'd finished at that stage. Um, if it's a brief one, I mean, I, John, you've got to be conscious that, and, and I just make this, this comment, I am, I'm desperately trying to get through allowing everyone the chance to speak, and, and, and you have spoken, um, so I'll let you come back in, but it's not something I'm going to do generally once you've already spoken. John. Thank you, Kavina. I wonder, thank you for the Cabinet Secretary. Can the Cabinet Secretary have a time frame for that assessment process, please? It starts this year, um, uh, and it should, the appraisal process should be completed by yeah, over, the financial year. Uh, over the course of this financial year. It should be completed. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'm going to call on Colin Smith to wind up and press or withdraw his amendment, please. Uh, th thank you, Gavina. I think there are two particular points raised. First of all, uh, Mike Rumbles uh, queried um, how you could have uh, a, an amendment that says a local authority must do something. However, there may be exemptions. Well, there are quite a few examples of that, I have to say. And, and I'm very clear in the amendment how those exemptions should work. The example is if a local authority can show that other action other than an LEZ is being taken to reduce levels of air pollution, then that is one way they could be exempt from imposing an LEZ because they have an alternative process in place to reduce air pollution. And I think it's perfectly reasonable, in fact sensible, that there should be a, an exemption um, a, a, along those grounds. The issue is making sure that action is being taken to, to tackle um, the issue of uh, illegal air pollution. The other point that was raised by, by Jamie Green and, and, and Peter Chapman was that this may result in LEZs um, being introduced uh, in other areas other than the ones that we already are aware of. Um, well, the reality is, if there is illegal levels of air pollution anywhere, then, frankly, we should be taking action to tackle that problem. We shouldn't simply say because we have a list of towns. So I'm happy to take an intervention. Yeah. Allowing the intervention. Now, I certainly agree with Colin Smith. There are other areas, not just cities. There are towns that, that, that people have concerns. And in fact, if you go to, in particular, Motherwell, sitting outside the Civic Centre at Motherwell, there is a air pollution uh, monitor, and, and the, the air pollution round about that area can, can sometimes be higher than what it should be. So, could I ask uh, Colin Smith not to press to have discussions with the Cabinet Secretary in order to uh, see what 
uh, it can be done in order for his amendment to be supported. I'll, I'll certainly come to that, that, that point in a second, but I think Richard Lowe makes a, a very valid point. There are other areas where there are levels of, of, of air pollution, and though, to be very clear, there is no safe level of air pollution, but there are areas where there is exceptionally high levels of air pollution that action needs to be required. And in those areas, it would not be a case of imposing an LEZ on the local authority if they did not, if they had set out clearly what action they were taking to tackle those levels of, of air pollution. But I take on board... Yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful for the member. I'm, I, I, I really must ask members, if they want to make points during the thing, please to make them during the time that they speak. If we continue to get interventions right the way through as a winding up, the problem is we will never get to the end of this. So I'm going to ask for some discipline. Um, Colin, I would ask you to move on, and if you want to take... Convener, can I say, if, if there's emerging points, it's yes. appropriate that they're addressed. Yes. We're here to scrutinise on behalf of our constituents, our parties, and it's important we make uh, good law. It's important to, to have full discussion on issues. Um, thank you, Mr Finney. I fully understand the legal process, and I also understand the parliamentary process, but I thank you for drawing my attention to it. Colin Smith, would, if you would like to take that, could I ask you to take that amendment and then move on, please? I'm happy to take the intervention. OK. Yeah. OK. Uh, thanks very much. Um, would the member accept that one of the measures that could be taken um, in an area where there is um, uh, high air levels of air pollution is to actually remove traffic from that area altogether? Absolutely, and there are a number of options, and that's one that I know my own local authority were looking at around a school, for example, that, that there shouldn't be vehicles in the vicinity of, of that school in a, in a town centre. That's not a city, that's an area where there are concerns over air pollution. So there are alternative actions that can be taken, um, and if local authorities are taking those actions, then it, it, that, that's why the exemption in this in this amendment exists. But I take on board that the points raised by the Cabinet Secretary over two, two areas, the, the work that's, that's ongoing at the moment, and secondly, um, the reference in... in, in, in in, in point three of my amendment uh, and, and the values set out in Schedule 2 of the Air Quality Standards, Scotland Regulations and, and the fact that the Government um, are, are looking at different, different areas. Um, on that basis, I won't press my amendment, but um, I would hope that the Cabinet Secretary will have discussions uh, to look at is there either an alternative amendment um, or work that can be taken in light of, uh, of the work that the Government are taking uh, over, over the summer period um, in order to, 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 to put in place a position whereby LEZs, which are regarded as an effective way to tackle um, air pollution, uh, do come into play um, where we do have these uh, illegal or very high levels of, of, of air pollution. Thank you, Colin. Uh, Colin Smith is, uh, not, sorry, wishes to withdraw amendment number 43. Does any member object? No. Therefore, the amendment is withdrawn. The question is that section 4 be agreed. Are we agreed? Yes. We're now going to meet, move on to the procedure for making a scheme for low emission zones, and I'm going to call Amendment 223 in the name of Peter Chapman Group with amendments as shown in the groupings. Peter Chapman, can you move Amendment 223 and speak to all the amendments in the group, please? Thank you, Convener. I will move Amendment 223 in my name. Amendment 223 is quite simple, really. This requires local authorities to prepare and publish an impact assessment of an area in which it wants to make a, an LEZ. It requires them to consider the environment, to consider equalities, in other words, ensuring that, for instance, low-income families are not detrimentally affected by its introduction, to consider the local economy. We, have to, we, we do not want to see local businesses and struggling high streets to be further affected by an introduction of an LEZ, and that should be taken into account. Uh, it could consider future policy plans and proposals as it sees fit. I mean, I would just say that Scotland is a diverse, is d diverse, and local authorities in Glasgow and local authorities in Aberdeen will not necessarily have the same objectives or considerations, and this wording allows each local authority freedom to assess different areas as they think will be impacted. Um, similarly, I, 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 on your uh, instructions, convener, I'm going to be very brief, and similarly, I support all the motions by my colleague Jamie Green in this grouping, however, I'll let him talk to his own uh, uh, amendments himself. I'll, I'll finish there. Thank you, uh, Peter. Uh, I therefore would uh, call on Jamie Green to speak to Amendment 35 and the other amendments in the group, please. Thank you, Convener. Um, I won't speak to all amendments in this group. There are 20 of them, so I'll, I'll stick to the ones that I'm proposing. 
uh, in the interest of time. Um, uh, Amendment 35, uh, and linked to that, helpfully, is 36, 37, 191 and 198, which are consequentials of uh, Amendment 35. And let me explain what I'm trying to achieve by this. The bill currently stipulates that approval from Scottish ministers is required to do three things, set up, amend and revoke a zone. Uh, and whilst I think it seems sensible uh, for a government to approve the setting up or indeed to make substantial changes to a zone, my men proposes that local authorities should have the power to revoke a zone at their uh, discretion. For example, if a zone is deemed not to be meeting its intended objectives or is indeed having a detrimental impact uh, on, uh, uh, on their area, if a local authority or indeed multiple local authorities have set up a zone, uh, should have the power to revoke a zone unilaterally. It goes back to my earlier point about having a purpose to a low emission zone. Uh, there are many reasons why a lo local authority may choose to revoke a zone. At the moment, uh, the current scenario says that ministers could block revocation of a zone. There are many reasons for that. I'd be keen to hear why the minister needs or wants that power. Uh, it could be to meet its own national or indeed international obligations, which is a fair point. Uh, but that would be at the expense of the local authority who no longer wishes to operate a zone. My belief, therefore, is that the local authority should have the final say on closing a scheme down if they choose to do so. The other amendments are consequentials and remove the revocation power from ministers accordingly. Uh, if I move to Amendment 189, uh, which is the uh, next substantive uh, amendment, um, this uh, amendment would oblige that before seeking permission from the Scottish Government to set up a zone, a local authority must provide a statement to the ministers underlining uh, two things. Uh, what consultation took place in line with Mr Chapman's suggestion that there should be impact assessments and full and, and robust local consultation before setting up a zone and in, uh, indeed the outcome of that consultation and how the findings from that consultation have been considered in their proposals for a zone. And I think this will assist ministers in coming to view whether the approval of a zone uh, goes ahead or not. Similarly, Amendment 190 then says that Scottish ministers must take into account the statement provided by the local authority, uh, indeed, uh, as 189 suggests, as part of their decision-making process. Uh, and I, I hope that uh, members will find this a helpful addition to the setting up process. And finally, Amendment 38, which is uh, something different. Um, and this quite simply pertains to what requires ministerial approval. I have added wording that says that the section under which uh, the, the, the elements which have to be approved by ministers um, a, a, on the face of the bill states that it does not require the approval to specify the geography of a low emission zone or the times or dates of operation under which it operates. I've always been of the view that the government should indeed set the national standards in terms of vehicle standards, exemptions, approved devices and so on, but local authorities themselves should and make local decisions on the practical operation of the zone, which includes the geography of the zone and when it operates. Uh, so I've, uh, for that reason, that amendment will, uh, seeks to remove that approval from ministers and therefore the final decision will be made by the local authorities uh, themselves. Thank, um, you. thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Um, now, Colin Smith, can you speak to Amendment 44 and any other amendments in the group, please? Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, amendments 44 uh, to 48 in my name add to the list of statutory consultees uh, when it comes to establishing the LEZ to ensure the feedback is, uh, in my view, more balanced. Uh, 2,500 deaths a year in Scotland are attributed to air pollution, and given the significant health risks of air pollution, I believe, as is set out in Amendment 44, that health boards um, and organisations representing those with, with health conditions caused by air pollution should be consulted when it comes to the development of these schemes. Likewise, the introduction of LEZs will have an impact on pedestrians, cyclists, public transport users, and I believe it is right that they have the opportunity guaranteed to feed in during the, the consultation process. Amendments 192 to 197 by John Finney likewise add to the, the list of statutory consultees, and I think these are all worthwhile. Amendment 193 clearly has the same aim as my own Amendment 44, and I'm happy not to press mine and support Amendment 193 instead, providing it's pressed, of course, on the grounds it clarifies that this should include any health board uh, only partially 
uh, in an LEZ. Now, I can't think of an example where a current health board boundary would make this necessary, but of course, health board boundaries do change. Therefore, it's a sensible recommendation. Amendment 196 calls for bus users to be consulted. I think this is something I, I very much support. Uh, and although it is potentially covered in my Amendment 47, um, if there is an argument for specifically name checking bus users, uh, I am not opposed to that particular amendment. I do not support the other uh, amendments um, that have been um, tabled, possibly with the exception of uh, Amendment 223 and, and, and Peter Chapman's name. I can see the benefits of that particular amendment requiring local authorities to undertake impact assessments before in introducing LEZ. I am concerned, however, that, um, that we make it too burdensome, um, and I think that is important that we do not do that. Um, and, but on balance, uh, you know, the need for analysis, um, which I would expect most local authorities would undertake anyway, uh, is certainly something uh, worth, worth considering. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. John Finney, can you speak to Amendment 192 and any other amendments in the group, please? Thank you, Convener. Yes, um, it, it is basically, I uh, will not repeat a lot of what Colin said there, the, the, the bodies outlined Community Council, Health Board, Children's Commission, or Trade Unions, Staff Associations, and less. Are there all people who would have a, a particular dimension to add to, to discussions that would take place in this? And I, and, and, and I hope members will see that that is appropriate. Um, it is very hard to argue, very hard to argue against um, a, a rigorous impact assessment being made in respect. and. And indeed, Mr. Chapman's Amendment 223. I have some reservations about paragraph um, C, which talks about the economy of its area, because I, I, I would hope there would be consideration about the economic impact of not putting in place um, um, a low emission zone. Um, so um, I'm still as yet undecided on that, um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Stuart Stevenson. Um, convener, I just speak on uh, 192 John Finney's uh, amendment, um, and, and just on the very narrow point that the 1973 uh, Act to which his amendment refers, um, establishing a community council does not imply there is an operating community council, because the scheme brought forward by the local authority uh, would cover all the areas. But as we as we know, much of Scotland community councils that should be there just ain't there. Now, in any event, when you look at the legislation at uh, section 51.2, the general duty of community councils is to do this anyway. So in legislation, the community council are already doing it. So I think it, there's a bit of ambiguity in requiring uh, that some th some bodies that actually don't exist in the real world have is to be consulted. On I, I, I don't think it's worth it, really, to be honest. I don't know what it is. Convener. <laughs> well, <but laughs> convener. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Um, Cabinet Secretary, uh, would you like to uh, speak to this amendment, please? Convener, Amendment 223 in Peter Chapman's name would require local authorities to prepare and publish impact assessments before making, amending or revoking low emission zone schemes. Local authorities already have legal duties to carry out various impact assessments across environment and equalities for programmes, plans or proposals. In addition, I understand that some local authorities do carry out business impact assessments. The carrying out of impact assessments for new policies is an issue that is well understood by local government. As such, the amendment is unnecessary and potentially confusing in how it cuts across existing legislation, and on that basis I would urge a committee to reject it. However, I, I can assure Peter Chapman that material on the suite of impact assessments required under existing law would be outlined in the LEZ guidance. Amendments 35, 36, 37, 191 and 198 are raised by Jamie Green, and they collectively aim to alter ministerial powers on the topic of revoking an LEZ, such that ministerial powers would extend only to an LEZ scheme being made or amended, but not being revoked. This is arguably, there is arguably no gain in achieving, uh, achieved by removing such powers. Indeed, removing these powers would weaken the scrutiny placed on LEZs, particularly at a crucial point where a scheme is to be revoked and removed. Removing ministerial scrutiny powers around the revocation of LEZs would not be in keeping with the current approach adopted within the local air quality management process. 
Local authorities must demonstrate to ministers that an air quality management area can be revoked and that there is scientific merit in doing so. As such, there should be an expectation that similar scrutiny would be afforded to the revocation of LEZs. Amendment 36, uh, th 36 and 37 uh, follow Amendment 35 on the basis of revocation powers. As such, Scottish ministers could only make modifications to an LEZ scheme proposal or consult with stakeholders where a scheme is made or amended, but not where it is revoked. Again, this removes a necessary level of scrutiny and accountability from the process, so I would urge the committee not to support these amendments. Amendment? Yep, I'm happy to give way. Um, I'll, I'll try and be brief, convener. Um, but isn't, I appreciate the uh, uh, issue around scrutiny and transparency and the government's ability to scrutinise its own. There are lots of other bits of the bill that allow the government to do that in terms of reports, annual reporting and so on. But the point I'm making here is that if a local authority choose, uh, wishes to uh, close a scheme down for any reason, you at the moment have the power to say, no, you can't. And that's the power that I'm trying to remove. You haven't quite justified it. Well, uh, for the very reasons that I've just outlined in the way in which we operate with uh, local air quality management process, is that it has to be quantified and demonstrated scientifically that there's merit in revoking uh, such a scheme and removing such a scheme. We would expect the same for LEZs, given what their purposes are, so that local authorities, when they are seeking to revoke them, is that they're able to show merit for the reasons as to why they're choosing to uh, revoke it. Amendment 189 would hold the local authority to account in demonstrating the consultation. Responses were considered in a meaningful and accountable way. And Amendment 190 would direct Scottish ministers to consider the actions undertaken by the local authority under Amendment 189 in their decision-making around the approval of an LEZ scheme. Given that consultation is already a requirement in the Bill, local authorities would already consider the outcome of the consultation as part of the scheme proposal submitted to Scottish Ministers, and so these amendments are not required. However, in the interest of transparency, I am prepared to support the principle behind these uh, amendments, but I would ask Jamie Green not to press them today on the basis that my officials will look at them with a view to bringing forward amendments to achieve the effect sought at stage three. Amendment 38 would remove the requirement for Scottish Ministers to uh, give prior approval to parts of the scheme proposal uh, relating to the scheme area and in the event that the scheme seeks to set out alternatives to the default position that LEZ, of, of, that LEZ operate at all times. Amendment 38 it should be rejected because Ministers should be expected to approve a scheme in its entirety, not just portions of the scheme. Arguably, the scheme's geographical extent and its hours of operation are two of the most significant and controversial elements of a scheme. Stakeholders would certainly expect such aspects to be considered by ministers and for ministers to raise queries on such issues as a form of its challenge function before any approval to the scheme as a whole is given. Amendment 191 would see local authorities undertaking prior consultation with listed stakeholders only for an LEZ scheme being made or amended but not revoked. Again, I do not think this is advisable as it removes a level of accountability from the revocation process and for that reason I would urge the committee to reject this amendment. A number of amendments are proposed on the topic of prior consultation which would see extensions to the mandatory list of stakeholders to be consulted. Given that regulations under Section 6e would already allow this list to be expanded, I am inclined not to be too prescriptive on the face of the Bill, but I am happy to commit to using the Section 6 powers to add the persons listed in Amendment 44 and 45, and 192, 193, 194 and 195. I am inclined not to support amendments 45, 46, 196 and 197 because I think they are framed in too open and too open-ended a way to be legally meaningful for local authorities, but again, we would be happy to incorporate similar requirements into Section 6 regulations. 
Whilst I appreciate the sentiment behind Colin Smith's Amendment 48, given that, the, that one of the key drivers behind improving air quality is to improve the health of those most affected by air pollution, I believe that the scope of this, as drafted, is simply too wide, meaning that it would be very difficult to deliver in a meaningful and practical manner, and on that basis I cannot support it. Finally, uh, returning to the topic of revo uh, revoking an LEZ, Amendment 198 focuses on the issue of a local authority having the power to cause a local inquiry to be held, but the effect would be to allow this only to happen when an LEZ scheme is being made or amended, but not when an LEZ scheme is being revoked. Again, I think this approach would remove an important power of scrutiny from the revocation process, and I would urge the committee to reject it on that basis. As such, I would ask Peter Chapman, uh, Jamie Green and John Finney and Colin Smith not to press the amendments in this group, but if they are pressed, I would urge the committee to reject them. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I'm now going to call on Peter Chapman to wind up and press or withdraw his amendment, please. Thank you, Convener. Um, you know, I've heard, I hear and listened to what the Cabinet Secretary has to say, but I, I actually think it's right and proper that the you know, local authorities should prepare and publish an impact assessment. We need the analysis of the effects of uh, putting in place an LEZ. Now, this doesn't mean that to say that the LEZ won't be put in place, but it's right to have the debate, and it may allow other mitigation uh, measures to be, to be put in place. Um, and so I, I, I think it's right and proper that that allows the questions to be asked and it, it allows that debate to be had. So I think it's important that we do uh, go down that road before they're put in place, LEZs are put in place. So I am, I'm going to move uh, Amendment 223 in my name. Thank you. Um, so, having done that, I, the question is that Amendment 223 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. Uh, we're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Uh, there were five votes, four, six votes against, therefore the amendment was not agreed. I therefore call Amendment 35 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 223. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I now call Amendment 189 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 223. To move, uh, Jamie Green to move or not move? Uh, based on the Cabinet Secretary's comments, I'll not move. Thank you. Um, I therefore call Amendment 36 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 223. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 37 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 223. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. OK. I call Amendment 190 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 223. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. I therefore call Amendment 38 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 223. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. Uh, the question, therefore, is Section 5 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. I therefore call Amendment 191 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 223. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. I therefore call Amendment 44 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 223. Colin Smith to move or not move? Not moved on the basis of, of John Finney's Amendment 193, which is better working. OK, I therefore call Amendment 192 in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 223. John Finney to move or not move? Move, convener. Thank you. Uh, the question, therefore, is, is that Amendment 192 be agreed? Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. Uh, therefore, there is a division. I would ask those in favour to raise their hands, please. OK. Those against to raise their hands, please. OK. There are, there two, there are therefore two votes in favour, nine votes against. Therefore, the motion is not, the amendment is not agreed. I call Amendment 193 in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 223. John Finney to move or not move? Move, Kandina. The question that is that Amendment 193 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There is a division. Um, therefore, those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. 
Okay. The, there are therefore five votes in favour. There are six votes against. Therefore, the amendment is not agreed. Uh, I call amendment uh, what's, what's that? What, 194 in the name of John Finney already debated with amendment 223. John Finney to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. I uh, therefore call, call amendment 195 in the name of John Finney already debated with amendment 223. John Finney to move or not move? Move. Okay. The question is that Amendment 195 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There is therefore a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. Thank you. There are two votes in favour of Amendment 195 and nine votes against. Therefore, it, the amendment is not agreed. I call Amendment 45 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 223. Colin Smith, to move or not move? It move. Can the question is that Amendment 45 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There is therefore a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. <laughs> OK, thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. OK, there were two votes for Amendment one, uh, 45 and nine votes against, therefore the amendment is not uh, agreed. I therefore call Amendment 46 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 223. Colin Smith to move or not move? It move. The question, therefore, is Amendment 46 be agreed? Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. OK, those against, please raise their hands. Thank you. There were two votes uh, for this amendment, nine votes against, therefore, the amendment is not carried. I call Amendment 47 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 223. Colin Smith to move or not move? It move. Sorry, I didn't hear. Move. Thank Sorry. you. The question is that Amendment 47 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. Uh, there, there are two votes for and nine votes against. Therefore, the amendment is not agreed. I therefore call Amendment 48 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 223. Colin Smith to move or not move? It move. The question is that Amendment 48 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for this amendment, nine votes against, therefore the amendment is not agreed. I call amendment 196 in the name of John Finney, already debated with amendment 223. John Finney to move or not move? Move, Camilla. Thank you. The question is that amendment 196 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There is a division, therefore are those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for this amendment, nine votes against, therefore the amendment is not agreed. I call Amendment 197 in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 223. John Finney to move or not move? Not move. Can you? Thank you. The question therefore be, is that Section 6 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 198 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 223. Jamie Green to move or not move? Uh, not move. Uh, the question, therefore, is that Section 7 now be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question, therefore, is Section 8 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 199 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 185. Jamie Green to move or not move? Bear with me, can you know? Uh, move. 199, sorry. 199, move. Sorry, did I say something else? No. no. Yes. Sorry. Move. Moved. The question is that Amendment 199 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There's a division. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. OK, there are three votes for this amendment, eight votes against. Therefore, this amendment is not agreed. I call Amendment... Uh, 200 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 185. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not move, Camilla. Thank you. 
I now move on to the next section on low emission zones, which is the contents of schemes. I'm going to call it Amendment 49 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendments 2, 2, 4 and 50. Cabinet Secretary, please can you move Amendment 49 and speak to the amendments in the group. Convener, this uh, group of amendments concerns the content of LEZ schemes. Amendment 49 would allow local authorities the option to set the vehicle scope of their LEZ from the outset. This approach is commonplace in European LEZs and is also being used to set up clean air zones in England. This, could, this would mean that each LEZ scheme would be able to identify the vehicle types that are incorporated into the scheme using the scientific information available, rather than making LEZs applicable to all vehicles. This, type, this vehicle type uh, would, align with, uh, would align with those uh, published by the Vehicle Certification Agency, so this approach is quite different to the creation of exemptions, which is likely to focus on very specific uses of vehicles. This amendment would not impact or limit the overall ambition of an LEZ, rather it would enable a proportionate and targeted approach to address those vehicles which contribute significantly to air pollution in certain locations. Amendment 50 works in tandem with Amendment 49 to ensure that LEZ schemes can make different provisions for different types of vehicles. This means that LEZ schemes will be able to introduce specific provisions for specific types of vehicles rather than offering a catch-all provision for all vehicles. For example, the design of grace periods would also need to adjust accordingly so that they align with certain types of vehicles. And Amendment 50 would achieve this outcome. This leads me to. I'm happy to give way. Yep. Thank. I thank um, Secretary. Again, does that not come back to the fact that, that basically what you're saying is that councils could exempt classic cars, could exempt uh, uh, old buses <laughs> uh, in regards to shows? Is that not another section where the council could take that provision? It gives them some flexibility and be able to do that um, alongside the national exemption arrangements. This leads me to Amendment 224. This amendment would make it mandatory for local authorities to include an objective to improve transport-related emissions around schools by 2021. Clearly, improving air quality around schools would be universally welcome, and the generality of the power to specify a scheme's objectives in the Bill under Section 91C would already allow such an objective to be set. In fact, I would encourage local authorities to consider this specific aspect when setting their LEZ objectives. However, I would draw attention to a number of issues with this amendment. Firstly, the 2021 date. It may not align with the grace period and enforcement timetable with a local authority that a local authority may wish to assign to an LEZ scheme. For example, low, the low uh, emission zone plans for all vehicles uh, will not come into effect in Glasgow until the end of 2022. This is also true for Edinburgh's draft plan for their citywide LEZ. Secondly, this amendment is too short term and would not be applicable after 2021. Thirdly, uh, an, an LEZ will seek to improve air quality across its whole area, so setting an alternative air pollution reduction target for a small locality seems unworkable, given that LEZ powers will be standardised across its area. Finally, actions in various cities are already underway via existing air quality management action plans to reduce transport-related air pollution around schools, such as minimising vehicle idling outside schools, and these are being delivered without the need for an LEZ. It is for these reasons that I would ask the committee to reject Amendment 224 and to support Amendment 49 and 50 in my name, and I move Amendment 49. Um. I'm sure we'll come to that. Uh, thank you. Uh, David Stewart, could you speak to Amendment 224, please, yeah. and the other yeah, amendments in the group? Thank you very much, Convener. I've laid this amendment as I want to open up discussion about air pollution and who it is affecting. As we all know, the people it hits hardest are the most vulnerable, that's the oldest, the youngest, and those with comorbidity or other health conditions. 
The children of Scotland have done nothing to contribute to air pollution, and yet often the air quality around schools is shockingly low. As they spend at least six hours a day there, we need to do all we can to ensure a higher quality of air than that they are breathing in. On top of the vulnerability of children, uh, convener, there is also the issue of the social economic bias. The lower uh, income band you are in, the more likely you will live surrounded by poor air quality. So it is really a no-brainer that breathing in air pollution causes heart and lung conditions, among others, and will exacerbate other health conditions too. So we really need to be doing everything we can to improve air quality. Now, I know from this debate and others that other MSP colleagues have been doing work on how air quality can be monitored. I have listened to John Finney earlier and to Colin Smith. And I believe that Maurice Golden has put forward for air quality monitors to be added to schools. It would be a positive way to show whether or not LEZs are working if we can show that children are better protected. And I move Amendment 224 in my name. Thank you, David. Um, now, Mike Rumbles, you would like to speak to this moment. Thank you, Convener. Um, with reference to the intervention just a moment ago from John Finney um, about the types of vehicles that local authorities can exempt, um, I'm surprised when we were discussing or debating the Middle Fraser's amendments earlier on that the focus in those his amendments were on the fact that he wanted on the face of the bill that the minister said it could be addressed in reg ministerial regulations, but now it's just been confirmed, as I understand the intervention and the minister's response, that with amendments 49 and 50, it does give local authorities, uh, when they set up and propose their uh, uh, emission zones, the ability to exempt cars, for instance, over 30 years if they so wish. And I would really just want to make sure that I have understood that correctly, and therefore I'll be very supportive of 49 and 50 from the government, because as I understand it, when we, I can see the Minister taking advice from officials, so I'll just say, I'll just say one more point. So if the Council has to uh, set up the scheme, it must say the zone to which it replies, it must be a, a referenced on a map, it must specify the roads, a part of the roads that form, the date at which the scheme comes into effect, and the types of vehicles to which it applies. Therefore, logically, when I'm reading this, if we accept this amendment, then it the, empowers the councils to exempt the classic cars that Meadow Fraser's amendments dealt with. And, I would, and there's something, Minister, something up. I would like that confirmed. Thank you. Um, Peter Chapman. Peter. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, I mean, I, I, I support both the Carbon Secretary's amendments in this group, but I would, the, the, the one caveat I have is that I, following up on Mike Rumble's uh, uh, intervention there about the classic cars thing, the, the problem I have is that it allows different rules for different uh, local authorities, as I understand it. So Aberdeen, Aberdeen local authority could allow classic cars into an LEZ, and Glasgow could not. Is that, uh, uh, you know, I'd ask the cabinet secretary to clarify that point uh, as regards the, you know, having a, a scheme that's that's uh, the same right across the country. As far as a. Uh, David Stewart's uh, Amendment 224, um, uh, you know, this is an objective we are very keen to see met, and, and so we support the principle of this amendment entirely. However, however, I am concerned with the time constraint of 2021, as uh, you know, in practicality, this date would be impossible to meet because many of the LEZs will, will not be in place by that date. So, I mean, if this amendment was brought back at stage three without this time constraint, I think I would be more than happy to, to support it. Thank you, uh, Peter. Colin, followed by Jamie Green. Thank you, Convener. I have to say, I, I do have concerns over amendments 49 uh, and 50, which allow local authorities to make exemptions for, a vehicle, for vehicles. Um, a number of stakeholders highlighted the need for consistency across the country. And the reality is, so did this committee. Our stage one report was very clear. We stated, and I quote, the committee believes that to avoid confusion and to encourage compliance, there must be consistency across the country as to which vehicles can enter an LEZ and which are exempt. So that was the view of this committee in our stage one report just a few weeks ago. I think different exemptions across the country could con create confusion for those travelling between different local authorities and will make the message around LEZs more difficult to communicate with the public. It is also 
very much an open power which could be used to significantly weaken the effectiveness of LEZs if it wasn't used appropriately. So I do have concerns over those two amendments, um, and as I say, so did this committee just a few weeks ago. In terms of Amendment 224 uh, in David Stewart's name, I think it's a very welcome uh, addition. There's a specific issue around air pollution outside schools, and I think it's fair to call for schemes to be working towards a clear target in this regard. I think there would be an opportunity if this committee agreed the amendment to amend the timescale at stage three if that was the main concern uh, and if we were to agree the principle at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jamie Green, followed Thank by Richard Law. Thank you, Convener. Um, can I first of all speak to 49 and 50 uh, from the Cabinet Secretary? Um, I hear what Colin Smith is saying. He's raising a, a very interesting point. I, I actually agree in, in many respects because the committee was very clear uh, from the stakeholders that we took evidence from uh, over many months um, that they wanted consistency. And I think the Cabinet Secretary probably agrees with that principle of consistency. But my worry is that uh, including the types of vehicles which it applies, if the purpose of it is to allow a local authority to operate multiple zones, for example, or a zone within a zone, such as the case may be in Edinburgh, where you have an inner zone and an outer zone, and certain types of vehicles are eligible for entry into one but not the other. And if that amendment technically allows them to do that, that is fine. But if an unintended consequence of allowing local authorities to set the vehicle type means that they could create permanent exemptions, as we discussed, then it would, uh, as other members have alluded to, uh, inevitably lead to inconsistency where a driver may be eligible to drive into one zone in one city but not another zone in another. And that, I think the two uh, contradict each other because I'm unclear as to whether the government wants local authorities to decide which vehicle types can come in or whether the government wants to dictate a national standard on vehicle types. And I was always the view that, that I thought the committee was clear that it should be a national standard, uh, 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 at least technical standard, if nothing else. So I think that could benefit from some um, clarification. Um, and I think overall it paints a wider picture of, of a confusion around um, who decides exemptions, whether that would be in secondary legislation, whether it would be government regulations or whether it's local authorities themselves. And even if, according to the process as the bill dictates, local authorities specify the vehicle type in Section 9, the ministers still have the final power to approve or not the proposition given to them by the local authorities. And I think that's something that requires some clarification. And 224, can I just say, um, and there's two ways we can approach this, um, if the committee was minded to pass this uh, amendment as it's worded, I would suggest we remove simply the words by 2021 to make it competent, um, uh, and I would support it at that, uh, that level, but equally if the member did not move it, um, I would be happy for him to bring it back without those words, but happy to support it in the rest of its entirety as worded. Thank you. Um, Richard Lau, followed by John Finney. Yeah, I, I think basically as the morning has went on, and can I correct Mike Rumbles, it was actually me who raised the, the point about classic cars again for the second time with the Cabinet Secretary, and he basically has confirmed that a, a council could have the uh, discretion. But Jamie Green is correct. The, the committee, uh, through uh, all the discussion, has, if, if we're going to say it's going to be the same, penalty charge or whatever in, in all areas, it should be the same conditions in all areas. And that's why I would say to the Cabinet Secretary to look at the points that were raised by, in particular, Murdo, Murdo Fraser regarding classic cars, John Mason regarding classic buses. And in regard to David Stewart's point, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, low emission zones could be anywhere and everywhere that people want them. I've got two grandchildren, the same as Port possibly, sorry, three, two grandchildren that are going to school, uh, uh, three grandchildren, in fact, um, uh, one is uh, only one. Um, but basically the situation is that most of us do have uh, family or children, and we want to ensure that we, we get a better quality of air quality. So um, other areas may be um, going to have LEZs rather than just cities. Thank you, Richard. I'm glad you didn't forget one of your grandchildren. Uh, <laughs> that, would, that, that would have cost you later. Uh, John Finney, John. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's to, a couple of comments, if I may convene, and that is that a lot of the discussions we've had are about, if you like, a tension between central direction and local discretion, and I, and I think that's healthy that we do have that. Um, um, but to pick up specifically, I, I think it's important that we note what this committee said in, in its report. And, uh, 
Um, that's particularly with regard to, to 40 and 50. But I, I dare say, whatever we agree, that we're, we're not going to make everyone happy. So um, that's uh, that's not going to change, regardless of the legislation. What I would like to lend my support to my colleague David Stewart's uh, legislation. It is a very ambitious time frame. I'm sure David recognises that. But I would hope, nonetheless, that members would lend their support to it. Because if we can't, if we can't see to protect uh, children at school, then um, we shouldn't be here, quite frankly. Thank you, John. Um, Cabinet Secretary, uh, can I ask you to wind up, please? So, enough, so it may be helpful if I uh, uh, set out the purpose behind the uh, particular powers which we're setting out for local authorities here. This is to do with the scope of the LEZ and what comes into the scope of the LEZ. Is it buses, cars, HGVs that are all included within it? If, for example, we have a, a local authority who's looking to implement an LEZ, but the uh, scientific evidence for the problem within their town centre isn't cars, it isn't buses, it's HGVs. It allows them to set the scope of their LEZ, LEZ to apply to HGVs in order to tackle the issue, if that's what's having an impact on air quality and congestion. Equally, if there's a local authority is an area where all of the buses comply and are Euro 6 compliant, say, for example, in a city such as Aberdeen, and they're setting up an LEZ, it means that they have the flexibility not to include buses in it because buses are not the issue that they have to address through their LEZ. If cars are included within it, it means that, and they decide to include cars within it, it means that um, uh, vintage cars come into scope. And the way you deal with vintage cars is through an exemption for vintage cars. So if cars are not included within the scope of the LEZ, then vintage cars wouldn't be covered by it. So this is about setting the scope of the LEZ, what is covered by it. Is it let me finish this point. Is it, is it all vehicles um, of any standard, uh, or is it the vehicles which are causing them problems with air pollution for the very purpose for which they are actually setting up the LEZ in order to target it? And also gives them the flexibility to be able to then decide on if buses don't need to be included because they're all compliant and it's not causing the pollution, then they don't have to include it in it. It gives them the option, the ability to do that. Um, and if so, at a later date, say the buses become fully compliant, they can remove it from the LEZ because it's no longer required as well. I'll give way to Mr Smith, first of all, and then uh, Mr Rumbles. I, I just asked the Minister to clarify two things. I mean, if buses are already compliant with the level, then frankly they've got nothing to fear by being included in LEZ because frankly they can drive into that area because their buses are compliant, they don't need an exemption. But you know, sadly buses do change. Often a, a company will bring in a, an older bus um, a, a, and that would then be in breach of that. Um, but it would be okay because we've exempted them. So I, I'm not too sure of his point on, on buses, but can specifically answer the question about um, exemptions, would this amendment that's being proposed allow a local authority not to give an exemption for a, a whole scope of vehicles, cars, buses, but actually to give specific uh, exemptions around uh, vintage vehicles? Because I think the concern is having different rules no. um, in different areas uh, is, is what the committee were concerned about. No, it wouldn't. What, what it does is that it allows them to set the scope of the LEZ. So, for example, if, as I mentioned, if all buses which are being produced now, which are produced to the EU standards of being at Euro 6, uh, then uh, in five years' time, uh, for some areas, buses will no longer be in scope because they're compliant with what would be required with any LEZ that was put in place in the first place. Keep in mind what you're trying to address here. You're trying to address issues of pollution. Is it buses, trucks and cars that are causing it? Therefore, you would want the scope of your LEZ to cover those areas. If it is only trucks and cars, why would you have buses in it then? Because buses are already compliant with it. They are not causing the air pollution issue that you are trying to address. So this is about giving them the flexibility because uh, as we go forward and our local authorities look at implementing LEZs, things will change and the circumstances might be different there. Specifically on the idea of vintage cars, no, it would not give them the power to be able to do that. But if cars were not included within the scope of that LEZ, then vintage cars wouldn't be in it in the first place. So let me, uh, uh, let me deal with the Mike Rumbles next. I hope that clarifies the point for, uh, for Mr Smith. Thanks very much for taking my intervention, Mr. But if I was a local authority looking at this amendment and putting it into the, into the bill, and I said, uh, cars are an issue, so it comes into the scope, but it's polluting cars that are under 30 years old. 
You don't have to mention classic cars. You can just say as a local authority, I want to put in this zone all cars uh, up, up, to, up to 30 years old. Don't mention classic cars, but have the effect of excluding classic cars. That is what this would happen if this was in the bill. No. It's vehicle type. So they would have to, the vehicle type would be car, bus, HGV. So if you include car, it includes vintage cars. Yes, it's, it's, it's vehicle type. It's vehicle type. So give them the, so give them, it's the ability to set the scope of it, which vehicles are included within it, which is different from providing exemptions, which are set at a national level. So there's a consistency of approach. Mr. Mason. John Mason. That's OK. I mean, that was the same point. So you have clarified yeah. that. Yes, thank you. Is, it, is that you complete? Uh, if it answers the members' questions, well, this can be I'm, I'm not sure you'll ever answer everyone's questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the, the, the question that I have, uh, having had that wind up, is, the, um, is, um, is Amendment 49 agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed, therefore there is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. Okay, there were ten votes for, amendment, for the amendment and one vote against, therefore the amendment is agreed. I therefore call Amendment 201 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 32. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. Uh, I therefore call Amendment 224 in the name of David Stewart, already debated with Amendment 49. David Stewart, to move or not move? Um, convener, not move, but if I can say that I reserve the right to bring this back at stage three, and I thank the colleagues for the very positive comments, and if the Cabinet Secretary is agreeable, I'd like to meet him to get a, a wording that perhaps keeps one of the objectives, but perhaps reduces the issue around timescale. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will, will come back to you um, whether that's possible. I'm going to call Amendment 50 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 49. Cabinet Secretary, can you move it formally, please? Moved. The question is that Amendment 50 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question, therefore, is Section 9 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 202 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 185. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not move, convener. Thank you. I... Well, then, we're going to move on to low emission zones, so the power to set emission standards. And I want to give committee members uh, advance warning and the Cabinet Secretary that it's my intention to push on till 12.45 or thereby to try and get through as many amendments as possible. But that will really depend on how uh, the debate goes. So that's the sort of time I'm aiming for. So I'm going to call amendment in the name of Colin uh, 225 in the name of Colin Smith Group with amendment 184. Colin Smith, can you move Amendment 225 and speak to both amendments in the group? Thank you, uh, Convener. I'm happy to move uh, Amendment 225, which would allow a higher emission uh, standard um, target being set. Well, I appreciate the need for consistency in, in general. Um, I think there should be an element of flexibility when it comes to the actual target um, for emissions itself to allow for the creation of ultra-low emission zones. I think this is far easier to understand than a vehicle-based exemption, as the boundary um, of an ultra-low emission zone can be marked with appropriate signage. The national standard is likely to be something of a, of a compromise in order to ensure it is usable by everyone. This will mean areas with particularly severe air pollution problems won't be able to go any further than those dealing with a moderate issue. I think local authorities should have the power within reason to introduce ultra-low emission zones in the parts of their area with the most severe levels of air pollution. I'm not suggesting this should be allowed freely, but I do think it should be an option available to them, subject to agreement by ministers. This ministerial sign-off will ensure it is not misused. In England, the Clean Air Zone framework refers to minimum standards, given local authorities the flexibility to go further when needed. We have the job of balancing the need for a general consistency with the reality that a one-size-fits-all approach won't always work. I think limited, targeted ultra-low emission zones is the way to strike that particular balance. I'm happy to move the amendment in my name. Thank you, Colin. I'd ask the Cabinet Secretary to speak to Amendment 184 and the other amendment in the group, please. Uh, convener, Amendment 225 would introduce a power for local authorities to alter the emission standards for their 
local LEZ, such that they could make the emission standards more stringent for than the forthcoming nationally set standards and regulations. As we have already discussed during Stage 1, the regulations will most likely be the standard set for Euro 6 uh, for diesel and for Euro 4 for petrol vehicles. Having the emission standards set by Scottish ministers and regulations allows the, for national consultation with stakeholders to determine an emission standard that will work for all local authorities while retaining consistency for individuals. The existing powers in the Bill will allow the Scottish ministers to prescribe more stringent emission standards in future should that become desirable. As such, this approach could meet the desired outcome of Amendment 225 but would do so in a way that maintains national consistency. This approach could also dovetail with our commitment to promote the use of ultra-low emission vehicles by creating, in time, more challenging emission standards that only ultra-low emission vehicles could achieve. But we need to have clear and consistent LEZ emission standards to ensure that drivers will have the certainty to move between cities without worrying about whether their vehicle does or does not comply with different emission standards in different places. Having that consistency will also help vehicle purchasers make informed decisions when buying a new vehicle or planning a journey. It is therefore government policy to have a nationally set emission standard and regulations, and on this basis, convener, I would ask Colin Smith not to press Amendment 225, but if pressed, I would ask the committee to reject it. I put forward Amendment 184 to ensure regulations made to set the emission standards under Section 14A will be approved through affirmative rather than negative parliamentary procedure in response to a recommendation from Stage 1 by the Dele Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, who took the view that these regulations should be subject to the additional scrutiny afforded by affirmative procedure, given the significance of the issue to the Bill. I made a commitment to the DPLRC uh, to pursue this matter, and this amendment uh, makes that desired change. I would ask the committee to support Amendment 184 in my name and to ask Colin Smith not to press Amendment 225 and for the committee to reject it, should it be pressed. Thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Richard Lyle, followed by Jamie Green. Yeah, I can, I can see the point that, that Colin's getting at, but I have to remind him there are 32, 32 councils in Scotland, and whilst everyone's concentrating on a, a cities, there may be councils who think that they want to bring in zones within their <laughs> local areas. And the problem you have is, you know, depending on the card you've bought and depending on whether the information is correct by the manufacturer, uh, and some manufacturers get caught out on what, what they said that their cars were, um, you know, people could get very worried driving from one area to another. We've got, yes, we've got to have... Uh, um, uh, emission zones and we've got to ensure that it's a sta national standard and I think um, again I would say to Colin Smith to withdraw this. Richard, Jamie Green. Uh, thanks. Um, can I ask Colin Smith perhaps in summing up to clarify something? I mean, I, we had a very lengthy discussion in this session around national standards um, and confusion of drivers going from one zone to another and consistency I think we all agree is important. Would this amendment have an unintended consequence of basically inevitably leading to local authorities having different emission standards in their zones? And my question, perhaps not to Colin Smith, but perhaps to the government, is um, does the legislation as it currently stands uh, allow uh, local authorities to deviate from the national standard that regulations dictate? And I think it's right that regulation is the right place to dictate the technical standard. If a, local, if a local authority or a city wanted to have a, an ultra-low emission zone, could they use this legislation to do it, or would it require separate legislation, or indeed secondary legislation? Um, or is this amendment needed to give them that power to do it? I don't want to cause the, lo the localised inconsistency that we talked about, but equally this may be a power of benefit to local authorities. I'm just throwing it out there as a point of discussion. Thank you. Um, Cabinet Secretary, do you want to answer that particular point before I ask Colin Smith to wind up? Please? Yeah, my, my understanding for that is that you would require uh, it, 
different regulations to uh, set the standard that has to be applied for a low emission zone if it was to become a standard that would be viewed as being an ultra low emission zone. So um, uh, that would require regulatory change, which is the benefit of actually doing it through regulations is that that's a matter that can be brought back to Parliament without having to go to, uh, uh, go to primary legislation. Thank you. Um, therefore, I'm going to ask Colin Smith to, to wind up and press with his, uh, withdraw his amendment, please. Yeah, thank you, Convener. I think members are correct to say we did have a debate um, on uh, local flexibility earlier, and we, we agreed, um, or the committee voted, for local flexibility when it came to vehicles. Um, therefore, surely the principle stands when it comes to the actual area um, covered by the, the, the LEZ, which is actually easier. Um, to get messages across because of signage than it is in terms of saying that in one LEZ some vehicles are covered and in other LEZs um, in another part of the country um, other only other vehicles are, are actually covered. Uh, my fear still remains that, that the national standard uh, that uh, is likely to be something of a, a compromise um, to, to ensure um, it is usable by everyone and this means that those areas with severe air pollution problems um, won't go any further than an area that's, that has a moderate uh, issue, albeit all air pollution is, is, is dangerous. So I do think that flexibility, and this is not a uh, this is not a, a, a freely used power. This is one that would be used in very exceptional circumstances, where there is an exceptional high level that requires to go beyond um, what, what, the, what the standard is across um, across Scotland. So I, I do think this is a, a, a proposal that, that that's merited in exceptional circumstances, and that's why the ministerial sign-off part is, is is contained within within the particular amendment. Thank you. So are you pressing or withdrawing? I'll, I'll press my amendment. Okay, thank you. The question that, um, is then amendment 225 be agreed? Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. Thank you. There are two votes for this amendment, nine votes against. Therefore, this amendment is not agreed. Uh, I would like to move on, low, on to periods of operation and suspension on low emission zones. Before I call Amendment 51 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, I would like to point out that if Amendment 226 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendments 53 and 54. Furthermore, if Amendment 205 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendments 62 and 63. So, Cabinet Secretary, I'd like to ask you to move Amendment 51 and speak to the amendments in the group. Cabinet Secretary. Convener, the amendments in this group can be divided into three broad areas. The suspension of low emission zones for events, hours of operation and grace periods. On the temporary suspension of LEZs for certain events, the Government has put forward Amendment 61, 62 and 63 to make necessary and pragmatic modifications to Section 18 of the Bill. The Committee will be aware that there were various views during Stage 1 regarding such uh, suspensions and the definition of what may constitute such an event. What is clear above all uh, from the quite diverse views here is the flexibility that flexibility is needed, and that is what these amendments attempt to secure. Amendment 62 broadens the scope of how an event that would qualify for a temporary suspension would be classified. The original focus on national importance was deemed to be too limiting and too vague to many stakeholders. It was noted that councils can hold events which are of substantial local importance, such as sporting events or festivals. Therefore, this amendment would allow for suspension regarding such local events, with further detail to be set out in further guidance. However, in order to ensure such temporary suspensions cannot just continually continue indefinitely, Amendment 63 sets a seven-day limit in the absence of prior ministerial approval. This time frame was arrived at after discussion with local government officials with experience in this area. Connected to this, Amendment 61 uh, allows for flexibility regarding the geographical scope of such a suspension. The effect would be to allow a local authority to suspend either the whole or only part of the area of an LEZ where the event is being held, offering necessary flexibility. Amendment 205 allows a local authority to suspend a scheme indefinitely without having to state the purpose 
while Amendment 206 does the opposite, meaning an LEZ cannot be suspended under any circumstances. Either of, neither of these options would work in practice and would not offer the local authority the flexibility to operate an LEZ in a pragmatic manner. Also, Amendment 60 looks to make all suspensions contingent on ministerial sign-off, which seems over, overly bureaucratic and runs against the grain of allowing a level of local flexibility as much as possible. Therefore, I feel the measures put forward by the Government strike the right balance on this issue. Amendment 58 stipulates that LEZs must operate at all times, with no option to adjust or alter these times, whilst the operation of LEZs 24-7 should be the default, and Section 13-1 of the Bill already makes that clear. There must be an option for local authorities to alter this approach if there is sufficient evidence to justify a different approach, noting that ministers will review the LEZ scheme's design, including the hours of operation. So again, the approach of Amendment 58 is too inflexible in practice. On grace periods, Amendment 49 was debated earlier in Group 8 to allow local authorities to have the option to apply LEZ restrictions to certain types of vehicles. This would be applied only where there was a viable case to do so and would still be subject to an impact assessment and ministerial sign-off procedure. My Amendment 51 and 52 follows on from Amendment 49. They ensure the requirement that the requirement in Section 10.3 for an LEZ scheme to specify grace periods for both residents and non-residents includes a requirement to specify the particular vehicle type exempt under each kind of grace period. There are a range of interesting ideas on grace periods within amendments tabled in this group from other members. Amendment 226 takes the approach of minimum grace periods with a sliding scale for various types of vehicles. Yet the amendment specifies no maximum limit, meaning that grace periods could be completely open-ended. Amendment 252 makes regulations made under the power uh, here subject to affirmative procedure. Conversely, Amendment 55 looks to set more stringent grace periods than those set out on the Bill. Amendment 53 and 54 also look to make alterations on grace periods. Convener, there are obviously wide and diverging views here, but I think the grace period in the Bill of between one to four years for non-residents, with up to a further two years for residents, is the most appropriate and balanced approach to be taken. As such, I would ask the committee to support Amendment 51, 52, 61, 62 and 63 in my name, and I would ask Jamie Green, Colin Smith and John Finney not to press the amendments that they have in this group, but if they are pressed, I would ask the committee to reject them. And I move fi Amendment 51. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Jamie Green, can I ask you to speak to Amendment 226 and any other amendments in the group? Thanks, Commissioner. Um, I'll do this in reverse order. Can I jump to Amendment 205 first? And, uh, the Cabinet Secretary was speaking about temporary suspension for events. Um, what my amendment does, uh, quite simply, if members are looking at the bill, uh, is on page 8 of the bill, uh, line uh, 10, is simply uh, to put a full stop after the words where the authority considers it appropriate to do so. Now, as it currently stands, uh, notwithstanding the amendments that the Cabinet Secretary has put forward subsequently, as it currently stands uh, in the Bill, local authorities can only suspend the operation of a zone when an event is to be held and is considered of national importance or, if passed, indeed of significant local importance. Uh, in effect, I just want to remove that top-down uh, rule that dictates local authorities when the suspension is appropriate or not. I think local authorities have the sense to make informed decisions about suspensions. Um, and therefore, the deletion of the rest of that section 18, uh, in my view, seems an appropriate uh, way to address this, to give uh, local authorities the power to make sensible decisions about suspensions. Uh, I trust their judgment in that respect. Um, on the issue of grace periods, um, I think a number of members are coming at this from different angles and different propositions, and I, I do appreciate the Cabinet Secretary's uh, acknowledgement uh, that there are differing views on this. Um, my worry is that by not by not moving our amendments, uh, that um, the concept of what we're trying to achieve is lost. 
And let me explain why. As it stands at the moment in the bill, in terms of grace periods, it simply di differentiates between residents and non-residents and sets a minimum and a maximum range for a grace period. Now, one could argue over the numbers, whether one to four years or two to six years is appropriate or inappropriate. But instead of our, uh, changing the numbers, I'd like to change the structure of how grace periods uh, are offered. And I appreciate it's quite difficult in word format to present this. This made a lot more sense in tabular format, um, uh, unfortunately. Um, under my proposals, I'd like to do things slightly differently. We would set a minimum grace period rather than a range. I think it seems appropriate to do so. We will still require uh, a maximum grace period. So the comment the Cabinet Secretary made that this could be endless is not true. Um, my amendment specifies that there must be an expiry. Uh, it's defined as a maximum period of time after the grace period begins. So there's still an onus to put a maximum, but it's up to each local authority to decide what that maximum is, depending on the needs uh, of their zone. And thirdly, I would introduce the concept of different types of grace periods for different types of vehicles. Now, what does this translate to for members' benefit? In essence, residents, as already defined in the bill, are given one extra year to prepare for the arrival of a zones, which I think is in line with the government's own proposals to give residents extra time. This is sensible. But by creating different categories of road users, local authorities now have the, different, uh, now have the technical ability to offer different grace periods to different road users. Um, I've chosen first uh, buses and coaches, who I believe are already well on their way to meeting the commitment and will have less of a problem. Secondly, commercial vehicles, who I think require additional time uh, to adjust to the new world. This is done with the primary objective to support small businesses in our cities, who are either based in the city or do business in their cities. And lastly, rollout arrives on the doorstep of everyday motorists and drivers, um, many of them and many of those who are most likely to be affected by the zone driving older cars, many of them for low, from lower income households or rural parts of Scotland. And it feels to me intrinsically fitting to give them uh, more time than other vehicle categories. And I would say this, that the government seems to already have identified the need for different grace periods for different vehicle types, as we see from Amendment 52. So I hope that the concept is palatable, even if we argue around the numbers, whether it's 1, 2, 3, or 2, 3, 4, and so on. So I would ask members to support the principle of this uh, structure. Um, and if, it, if, got, if you have any questions on it, I'd be happy to answer them. And indeed, at stage three, we have the ability to amend the periods involved in this. But the concept of what we're trying to achieve is to support small and medium businesses in our cities and support um, those uh, families who uh, need the most time possible to make that adjustment uh, and that modal shift that is needed in our cities. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jamie Green. Colin Smith, can I ask you to speak to Amendment 53 and the other amendments in the group, please, Colin? Thank you very much, Convener. Um, I can just briefly touch on Amendments 51 um, and 52 in the Cabinet Secretary's name. I, I, the only point I would make is, I, again, I'm not keen on allowing vehicle-specific exemptions at a local level. I think this does create confusion and inconsistency. And as with Amendments 49 and 50, it does directly contradict the Committee's Stage 1 report and what we called on. Um, therefore, I, I do continue to have concerns over those vehicle-specific um, exemptions. Uh, in terms of um, my own amendments, Amendment 53 uh, and Amendment 54 in my name provide local authorities with more flexibility to implement LEZs more quickly in instances where this might be appropriate. I think this will help future-proof the bill. While well, the introduction of an LEZ is a significant change for individuals at the moment and one which does require a fair lead-in period, this is not always going to be the case. This is a permanent piece of legislation and it should be open enough to deal with a range of scenarios both now and in the future. The issue of displacement was raised with the committee during our stage one considerations and I think provide more flexibility in grace periods would allow the boundaries of an LEZ to be tweaked if needed without requiring a two-year delay. You could have a situation in where a number of streets beside an existing LEZ um, uh, see vehicles displaced into that particular street. But under the way the bill works at the moment, you would require a two-year lead-in time, a minimum two-year lead-in time, for any residents within that area only simply for a minor tweak on a number of streets. And I don't think this provides uh, the common sense flexibility um, that we require. I'm not suggesting it should be common practice to go below the suggested minimums. And I think realistically, it's likely that most local authorities will choose um, to, to, to stick with the periods that are within the bill at the moment. But we should trust that common sense will be used in, as LEZs develop in the future. 
However, even if local authorities were inclined to use this um, flexibility inappropriately, ministers will still have final sign-off, meaning that LEZ with an unreasonable grace period will not be allowed even with the amendments that I propose. This is simply about removing something which may act as an unnecessary barrier to progress at some point uh, down the line. In terms of uh, amendment um, 55, this requires local authorities um, opting for the maximum grace period to have this decision uh, signed off by ministers. In light of the, the climate emergency, uh, we were asked to review every policy area uh, and to consider whether we are doing enough to address these issues. I think in this context, um, a local authority choosing to wait six years to fully introduce an LEZ really is questionable, and they should have to justify such a choice. In the interest of providing flexibility, I have not tried to reduce the maximum grace period. I'm simply seeking to provide some additional oversight on a decision such as this. Adding a specific mechanism on this particular issue separate from the general ministerial agreement process will make clear that the maximum grace period should not be the default option whilst leaving the option there if it was needed under what I would have to say would be exceptional circumstances. Amendment 226 by Jamie Green looks to, to move us in the opposite direction, I have to say, to my amendments. But given the urgency of this issue, the time it takes to even get to the point of formally introducing an LEZ in a natural life span, span, I have to say, of cars, I absolutely do not support slowing down the process any more than is necessary. Uh, Amendment 58 in my name clarifies that LEZ should operate 24-7. I think this will ensure that LEZs are as effective as possible and will provide the clarity and consistency that many stakeholders told us they needed. LEZs operating only part of the time will create confusion for drivers and risk undermining the very aims of the scheme. So we should be clear in the face of the bill that LEZs are to take place 24-7. And I have to say I have racked my brains to work out a single circumstance in which that should not be the case. When during the course of a day should an LEZ not function and what would the criteria be? And I listened carefully to what the Cabinet Secretary had to say and he didn't give an example either. That's why I think it is appropriate that the LEZs do work um, 24-7. Uh, Amendment 60 uh, in my name requires a decision to suspend LEZs for events of national importance to be agreed by Scottish ministers. Now, given this provision is meant for events of national importance, it seems right that this should be agreed at a national level. I appreciate there is an amendment here to include events of significant local importance, but even if this does pass, I think the additional oversight this amendment provides is needed. An important event is in itself not a reason to suspend an LEZ. In fact, in many instances, a large event will worsen air pollution making the LEZ all the more important. So there should be some process for identifying when this is actually needed, and I think ministerial agreement provides that and provides consistency across the country. Amendment 63 by the Cabinet Secretary requires any suspension lasting more than seven days to be approved by ministers. So I think there's somewhat a contradiction between uh, um, uh, what ministers are saying on events of a national importance and events that last more than seven days, which, which do require ministerial sign-off. As I said, I think any suspension under Section 18 should be subject to agreement by ministers. However, if the committee are not minded to support Amendment 60 in my name, I'm happy to support Amendment 63 at a minimum long-term suspension should be subject to approval by ministers. Amendment 206 uh, by John Finney uh, removes section 18 of the bill entirely. I have to say I'm sympathetic to this, but in the interest of delivering a flexible legislative framework, I would on balance prefer, prefer to include the mechanism uh, that, that I've put forward in my particular amendments, given more ministerial um, uh, oversight. Um, I think that it probably covers all my amendments, uh, convener, so I'll leave my comments at that. Thank you, Colin. Uh, John Finney, can I ask you to speak to Amendment 206, please? And any other amendments you want to? Yes, indeed. Um, what we do know, convener, is there's a lot of energy and effort will go into the creation of uh, low emission zones. And, and I think, as the Cabinet Secretary said early on, there's a, a range of positions here regarding this. And I, I dare say my Amendment 206 will be seen as a bit of a nuclear option. But there is a lot of energy and effort goes in. And uh, we will be supportive of Colin's uh, Amendment 58. Um, regarding um, it being 24-7, not 24-7 dependent on um, uh, the councils. I think there has to be a very clear signal given here that the, the intention of this is to uh, improve uh, the well-being of our citizens, and uh, that's not going to take place if there are, if there are um, um, suspension for events. And l let me say that you, you'll know um, of very specific areas where 
They have winter festivals, they have summer festivals, and they spend most of the rest of the time trying to find festivals to fit in between winter and summer festivals, all of which could lead to suspensions and all of which would mean this could well be a, a mockery. Um, I, I, moving to the, the grace periods, I think there's uh, some pragmatic approaches uh, adopted in respect of that. Um, but there's a lot of effort will go into the creation of these, and I wouldn't want to see it eroded. So uh, I, I hope... Um, I would have hoped in any case that national emergencies would overrun, override any particular um, issue, but we, we, we need to be robust in this. This is an important piece of legislation and it shouldn't be lightly dispensed with. Thank you, Ms. Finney. Uh, Richard Lau. Yeah, um, I hope I'm not jumping ahead, but I, actually, I, mean, I move Amendment 3 and Amendment 3A um, basically. Uh, and hope that members who supported me in the earlier part of the meeting will do so again. Um, regards to the points of the um, section for periods of uh, low emission zones, periods of operation, I'm reminded I spoke, spoke in stage one uh, in regard to comments made by the British Lung Foundation, and I quote, poor air quality increases everyone's risk of developing lung disease, cuts people's life short, makes existing lung conditions worse. So if we're going to have an LEZ, let's have it 24-7. We can't switch it off and switch it on when we want, when we want to because people's lungs don't switch off and on. They're continually breathe, breathing in. So as far as I'm concerned, uh, I will be uh, the um, uh, briefing that sent us by British Lung Foundation. I will be following it to a letter because, as far as I'm concerned, I think uh, in this case I have to uh, look after people's uh, lungs. Thanks for Mr. Lyle. No other members indicated they want to speak, so I would ask the Cabinet Secretary to wind up. It, briefly, um, can I just make a couple of points? The default position for any LEZ is 24 7. So any deviation of that would have to be uh, clearly justified uh, and, uh, and demonstrated uh, uh, for it to be to be agreed to. Um, can I turn to? Yeah, of course. Yes. C c can you give me an example of when it would ever be a request to not to have 24/7? What sort of circumstances do you see would happen where where where, where somebody would argue for it not to be 24/7? When would that be? Okay, it could be that, um, for example, in our cities it might not apply, but in some of our larger towns it may be that for. Uh, the very specific, remember the basis on which they're actually introducing the LEZ uh, might be on the basis that uh, it's a particular problem with buses um, uh, within that area, uh, therefore the LEZ applies to it. The bus services within that area may stop after 12 o'clock at night and not start again until 6, to which the council may say it'd be appropriate therefore for the LEZ not to apply because those vehicles are not there, they're not utilising the area. Um, so it's to, it's, it, it, but they would have to be able to specify that and evidence that in any application to ministers to consider it. So I'm conscious that there's a big focus on cities, uh, but in some of the uh, uh, small and larger towns that could end up having LEZs in the years ahead is that there may be a need for us to take a slightly more flexible approach, which if we don't have the power to do that, we'll be in a position where it may inhibit them from thinking about implementing an LEZ in the first place. And the final point I would like to uh, make, um, uh, sign officer, is it sort of you... yes. Thank the cabinet secretary for taking it. You know, you're saying that the, the council could suspend it between 12 and 6 o'clock in the morning. Um, you know, here we are. A local authority may suspend the operation of a low emission zone scheme for a specified period, where the authority considers it appropriate to do so for the purpose of the event. With the greatest respect, people don't stop breathing between 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock in the morning. At the end of the day, if it's going to be an early Z, it's got to be 24 7. End of story. Well, I appreciate your point. And um, I don't think it will come as a surprise to anybody here that you could go about six hours without breathing. But I, uh, what I would say to you is that um, uh, when you're setting primary legislation, you've got to potentially think about issues that may arise further down the line. And if you don't have the flexibility to address it, you're then back to having to address it through primary legislation because it wasn't anticipated at that time. That's why I'm emphasising the point is that the default is 27. Any deviation from that would have to be justified. But when you lock it into legislation, primary legislation, you don't provide any flexibility in future years should that be appropriate. 
and ministers can clearly be held to account when they make those decisions as well as to why they've allowed any flexibility uh, within it. So that's why it's about trying to future-proof the legislation rather than actually um, uh, uh, rather than ignoring that point. Can I just make the final point as well is that in relation to a, a, a Jamie Green's amendment, he said that it's incorrect to say there is not a time specified in it. The maximum time, um, uh, the maximum time uh, in, in your amendment as it stands at the present moment potentially could be indefinitely. So indefinitely applying it is an option for them. So notwithstanding the point which you've made, I understand that your view is that there is going to be a maximum to it, but the maximum could in the end be indefinitely. Um, and on that basis, I think it creates too much uncertainty in the matter. If it's very, if it's very brief, apologies, Mr Rumbles, it's a very important point, Grace Periods. Um, in that case, then, the Minister uh, and indeed the Government could submit an amendment at stage three and include a maximum if it so choose to do so, but my point is around the categorisation of vehicles and setting the minimums. Uh, would you support that? Well, we've already set out. Uh, in the bill and within our amendments, what we think the category should actually be, what the time frame should be, the one to four years and the potential two-year extension for residents. I'm winding up, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. Uh, there are now going to be uh, a series of votes, and I'd ask members to stick with me as, as, as we come to the end of this session. The first question is that Amendment 51 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. We are agreed. I therefore call Amendment 52 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 51. Cabinet Secretary, can you move it formally, please? Moved. The question is that Amendment 52 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I therefore call Amendment 226 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 51. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Moved. OK. I would remind members that if Amendment 226 is agreed, I cannot call Amendments 53 and 54 the pre uh, due to a preemption. The question is, therefore, Amendment 226 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. Therefore, there is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. <coughs> There are three votes in favour of that amendment, eight votes against, therefore the amendment is not agreed. I therefore call Amendment 53 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 51. Colin Smith, to move or not move? It move, convener. The question is that Amendment 53 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. no. We're not agreed. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes in favour, nine votes against, therefore the amendment is not agreed. I call Amendment 54 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 51. Colin Smith, to move or not move? It move, convener. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 54 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Oh, wrong hand. <laughs> Got almost carried away there. Uh, those, in, those not in favour, please raise their hands. <laughs> Maureen, I've joined a club. <laughs> there are two votes, four and nine votes against. Therefore, um, the amendment is not agreed. I therefore uh, call Amendment uh, 55. Uh, in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 51. Colin Smith, to move or not move? It move. The question is that Amendment 55 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes in favour, nine votes against, therefore the amendment is not agreed. The question is that section 10 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The, section, uh, the question now is section 11 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I want to call amendment 203 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with amendment 221. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not move, convener. Thank you. I therefore call Amendment 56 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 221. Cabinet Secretary, would you like to move it formally? Moved. Thank you. The question is Amendment 56 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I therefore call Amendment 57 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 221. Cabinet Secretary to move formally, Moved. please. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Section 57 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Amendment 
57 be agreed? I'm trying to go too quickly, I apologise. I'll read that. The question is that amendment 57 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question, therefore, is that section 21 be agreed. Mm. Uh, 12. Yes. 12. I am definitely going too quickly. My lunch is rumbling. <laughs> Uh, so, the question is that section 12 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. I therefore call amendment 3 in the name of Richard Lyle, already debated with amendment 221. Richard Lyle, to move or not move? Move. I therefore call amendment 3A in the name of Richard Lyle, already debated with amendment 221. Richard Lyle, to move or not move? Move. The question is that amendment 3A be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. We are not agreed there is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Yes. <laughs> That's bullying. <laughs> um, those against, please raise their hands. Made no difference, Mr. Lyle. Those votes, those in favour were five, those against were six. Therefore, the amendment is not agreed. I uh, ask Richard Lyle if he wants to press or, or withdraw Amendment 3. No, oh, press. OK, the question is that Amendment 3 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. We are not agreed. There is a division. Therefore, those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are five votes for, six votes against, therefore the amendment is not agreed. I therefore call amendment 58 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with amendment 51. Colin Smith, to move or not move? It move. The question is that amendment 58 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We are not agreed. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. We've all done it at some stage today, Stuart. <laughs> And those against, please. Thank you. There are three votes for. There are eight votes against. Therefore, the amendment is not agreed. The question is, set, is that section 13 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that section 14 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I now would like to say that is as far as we can go today. Um, and we will pick up next week where we have left off. Okay. Amendments to the remaining section of the bill can still be lodged, and amendments to the remaining provisions in part one and two uh, up until the end of this section 58 must be lodged by 12 noon tomorrow. Can I just say to committee members and the Cabinet Secretary, we, although we have made good progress today, it has been slow progress today, and we will need to work out the start and finish times and when we are sitting next week, and I will notify committee members uh, once I've had a chance to talk to the clerks and the deputy convener about that later today, I hope. Thank you very much, and I now uh, close the meeting. Thank you.